Okay, thank you, Clerk. And I now declare the meeting open to the public on, online. And I want to say good morning and welcome. Moitin Moy, August Tafalchi Rove, all members who are participating this morning by video conferencing to allow us to maintain the, the social distancing guidelines that are in place. Um, I would like to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. I would also like to remind everyone to please remain on mute when you're not contributing to the meeting. And uh, if, if members can uh, raise their hands in the chat function there for to indicate that they wish to come in on an issue. So members, um, no apologies have been received this morning. Are members aware of any other apologies? No, thank you. Okay, members, just two items there in Chair's business this morning. The first one is that I just want to, in light of the situation that's unfolding in India and the, the situation with the uh, vaccine availability around the world, um, and I do, I do note this morning that the U.S. administration has indicated that they are prepared to move on the issue of patents for vaccines. And I think the whole issue around equality and equity in terms of access to vaccines is a huge one for us all. We live in a globally very interconnected world. And I just want to, I suppose, draw members' attention to there are some campaigns out there promoting wider access to vaccines, and I'd like to draw members' attention to that. In particular, um, one that the uh, the EU are running an, a European Citizens Initiative, seeking signatures in support of uh, of the the concept of no profit on pandemic and right to cure or the right to treatment or the right to access to vaccines and uh, just like to flag that up to members if you, if you want to take a look at it there you can access it on no profit on pandemics.eu so um the other issue that i want to raise this morning and uh, we did an informal meeting last night with one of the groups and some of the members who have been impacted by the a mother and babies residences scandal. Um, again, a very harrowing meeting. I want to thank Paula um, very much for facilitating and bringing forward that meeting for members and to those members who were able to attend. I wasn't. Uh, some of the issues that were being that were being raised were of some concern. I have to say, and I'll bring Paula in a minute just to, to give us a fuller report. But. It was clear that there was, or it appeared to be clear, that there was limited support in terms of counselling and direct access to that type of support at this point in time. And I would be concerned about that, given that the process that, that those victims and survivors and families are engaged in privately present will inevitably uh, raise that trauma for them again. And they will, in some, in some cases, relive that trauma. And I think it's essential that they have very effective lines of communication between the various strands of the of the ongoing inquiry and also that they have the support um that that is that is so badly needed to, for them particularly in terms of psychological support so maybe just paula ask you do you want to do you want to uh, update members who weren't able to attend and maybe give us a, a view on how things finished up last night um, well, thank you, Chair, and thank you again to the members who, who attended. I appreciate we're all very busy in the evenings now. So, um, well, uh, I suppose the, the first thing would be to, to um, reiterate what you've said there around the fact that we've asked people to come forward. Um, we launched the, the, the assembly, the executive launched the research report, and this is this is um, meant that the birth mothers and the children for justice have had so many people, not just from this part of the world, but. England, down south, um, America, all coming forward, all very, very conscious that they were either um, in mother and baby homes and having children taken off them or were adoptees, and they're now very keen to trace their, their family. So it's, it's about the trauma, you're, you're right, but it's also about the support for that family tracing service, which, again, I don't think is, is fully functioning. I think they need far more resources. They need resources for things like the DNA tests, but then the, the, the wider issue around um, the TRIS recovery process, the um, panel that was set up to support them around how they um, look at an inquiry or some sort of investigation. I'm not sure that the communication and engagement has been as strong as it should be around a, a fully functioning, appropriate um, design, and, co sorry, co-design, co-production process. So um, I took a lot of notes last night. I'm going to send them through to the clerk, the, the committee clerk today then, and, and the, if you're fine with that, then, Chair, we would, sign, we would send it from this committee to the Department of Health to ask them to investigate the issues and see what can be done around additional resources and support for the birth mothers and their children. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paula. And, and I think one of the other issues that was raised is the need for a very effective public communications campaign to, to alert potential victims who haven't yet and, and to see if those, can be, uh, if those can be contacted. And that needs to be across a range of media. Social media is not something that everyone uses, uh, particularly older people, maybe in some cases or people with rural access and broadband issues. So I think it's important that that covers a range of media outlets. Um, I am aware that the Truth Recovery Strategy are in the process of, of setting up their, their website and their, their communications. But I do want to thank Birth Mothers and their Children for Justice for taking the time to brief us last night. And I do want to reflect that, that element of concern that it seems at this stage uh, that, that there's just not the, the connectedness that we would I want and hope to see at this point in time. So I think that's something we need to, to keep an eye on. OK, so thank you for that, members. Um, going then to the draft minutes. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll just take a wee quick check there from any other members in relation to last night's meeting, if members want to make any comments or if... Paula and I have covered it then that, that's fine. But if members wish to make any other comment? Okay. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll move on then, members, to our draft minutes, which are at uh, our, the meeting that we had on the 29th of April, last week's meeting, and the draft minutes are at tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yep, content. Thank you, members. And there are no matters arising then from those minutes today. So um, could I just check then, we're going to go into our, our first formal briefing in from Patricia Donnelly in relation to the vaccination programme. Clerk, do you want to uh, just ensure that, that uh, Brenton is in the spotlight there for the presentation sharing purposes? Brendan's up there now chairing the spotlight. And Patricia's in with us as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I would now like to very much welcome back to our to our meeting this morning, and uh, we're we're uh, joined this morning by Miss Patricia Donnelly. Patricia is head of the COVID nineteen vaccination program within the Department of Health, and Patricia has a. Uh, um, brief the committee on an ongoing basis, I have to say, and that's been very, very welcomed by us. And also, I want to acknowledge the continuing success and hope that the vaccination program is bringing to our community um, and to continue to wish Patricia and all of our frontline team who are working so hard at, at extending that out. And I, I, I'm pleased to see that that's now extended, I think, out to the 30, the 30 plus year olds. So we're looking forward to your presentation this morning, Patricia, and then uh, maybe a few questions and answers from uh, from members and yourself in relation to any specific issues that may arise. So uh, over to yourself, Patricia, to Fauci Road, you're very welcome, and please go ahead and give us your briefing. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, you have in front of you, it's not a presentation of mine. I thought you'd like to see the new Northern Ireland vaccination dashboard. So the address is at the top and, and uh, committee staff now have this so all members can click in and look at this at a regular basis. And this is now a direct feed from the vaccine management system. So there's much richer information. And that's particularly important because as we enter this final phase of the vaccination program, we also need to be concerned in Northern Ireland about vaccine equity. So we we also want to be sure that even with our high uptake levels that we have not missed anyone that we should be vaccinating. So the first screen that you see when you go on to the new dashboard will be the total number of vaccinations which you see is 1.4 million. And of these, 956,000 are first doses. And you'll see the number of second doses, 458. We're rapidly approaching a point where half of those who've been vaccinated have been fully vaccinated. And that is also very reassuring given that um, most of those will be in the most vulnerable uh, groups. You'll, you'll see in that screen that yesterday there were uh, nine and a half thousand vaccinations delivered. Um, we had been running anywhere up to 15,000 a day, but that varies each day, depending on the vaccine, depending on the bookings. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, it, there's always a slight delay. You will see on this when you go onto the vaccine um, dashboard um, that uh, the um, graph on the left will show the lower uh, um, line on that will be the target that we had and you'll see we exceeded it. I have briefed you previously about our start of the program and when you look at this now it looks like we made a slightly slower start 
But you will remember that we chose to try and, and succeeded indeed in vaccinating the most difficult and the most vulnerable population, which is care homes. And that did take a little longer in the first months of the program, but very well worthwhile when we see the impact on care homes now. Um, that's the, the, the running daily average. Um, which has this characteristic because community pharmacy and GPs tend to vaccinate in the middle of the week um, as they're rather busy beginning and end of the week. Um, trust vaccination uh, program is pretty straightforward. Can we go to the next screen? I think for me, this is the most interesting one. Um, and this will give you uh, the vaccine uptake. I ho hope you're able to see this. It's the same information cast in different ways. If you look at the, the uh, table um, in the bottom left uh, sector, you'll see that overall we've now vaccinated 65% uh, of the adult population, our target population. And we've worked down through the age groups. You'll see we've got 100% of the 80 year old plus. I mean, this has been a significant uh, achievement uh, to get that. For a long time, we were running about 96%, but we've now vaccinated over 7,000 um, of the housebound. Uh, and you'll see equally very high uptake rates in the over 70s, the 60 to 69. With a particular campaign around that group, um, they were slower to come forward, but once they did, uh, my goodness, they've really uh, taken uh, the vaccine. 50 to 59s, we're still booking on, um, and 85% of them, and we're actively booking the 40 to 49 uh, year olds. There are 71% of them. Um, as the chairman mentioned, um, we have opened it to the 30 to 39 year olds, and we've just over 100,000 of them vaccinated to date, which represents 41% percent of them. We've not yet opened it to the under 30 year olds, but you will see the 52,000 that are there will have been vaccinated as part of another cohort. So that will have been uh, carers, um, health and social care staff, or they might be clinically vulnerable. So uh, we will be going to this group next, but it will take some weeks. Um, there has been revised guidance from the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunization about the vaccination of the under 30s. We received that very recently. They have debated it for some time and they have advised that um, where possible that the under 30s should be offered um, uh, an, a non-AZ vaccine. And for Northern Ireland at the moment, that would be Pfizer and we will get Moderna next month. Um, so we've had to make some changes uh, in the program uh, to plan for that. Um, they're continuing to debate uh, the issue, so we do expect further advice to come from them. Um, but that means that uh, that age group will largely be vaccinated within the vaccination centres because Pfizer, as you know, it has been challenging to us. And with all the medicines governance around it, it has to be um, um, delivered within that um, uh, very safe and well-organised um, vaccination centre. If we go to the final screen, um, or the penultimate screen, I should say, uh, this shows um, who, is, who has been doing what. And uh, general practice have been vaccinating many of the vulnerable uh, right down to the age of 50. And you'll see that, that the bar at the top of the screen shows the darker band is first doses, the lighter band is second doses. So they're well through vaccinating people with their second dose. And we do have to keep saying to people, because you didn't get an appointment for your second dose doesn't mean to say your GPs don't know to call you and they will call as they set these clinics up. Um, typically it's 10 weeks, but it can be up to 12. And the other trusts, you'll see Southeastern Trust has um, really um, outstripped others. That's largely to do with the SSA arena. And uh, they also ran the uh, a clinic at the Ulster Hospital. And you can see for all of the trusts, they're well underway with second doses. And at the very bottom of this, you'll see Community Pharmacy, who came on a stream on the 29th of March and very welcome they were because while SSE was welcome to be able to deliver first doses, while many of the trusts were actively engaged in delivering second doses, we did need local access and community pharmacy provides that local access. So we've had a good partnership with the uh, CPNI and uh, the, the colleagues in the a health and social care board in the planning and delivery of this. So I think this is going to be a real key to the success of the program. And then the final screen. Yeah. 
okay? Uh, I, I think it will show you uh, the uptake by ethnic background. You will see there's a large number undeclared um, uh, that people have not chosen uh, to complete. But even within that, it starts to give you some idea of the the uh, of those uh, vaccinated. Um, you'll see the breakdown by vaccine, both first and second dose. And you see AZ has been a significant um, vaccine for us. And um, probably not for today, but when you click on this interactive map and you click on the plus sign, you can go, you can enlarge this, you can click onto any of the um, little circles, you'll get a BT code. And when you go into that BT code, you will see how many people have been vaccinated. Um, the digital team who have developed the vaccine management system have also advised that um, in the coming weeks, and I think it will be next week or the week after, they have, are also loading information on the population within that area. So not only when you click on, will you see um, how many have been vaccinated, but you will see which percentage of the population have been vaccinated. So, I mean, this is more than just um, uh, curious. This actually allows us to say other areas um, where there's lower uptake that we need to provide some mobile teams, where we need to provide additional vaccine to community pharmacy, where we need to do some inreach to try and ensure that um, everyone has equal access uh, to the vaccine in Northern Ireland. Uh, we can take the screen down now. Um, so you'll see that um, we achieved a lot to date, Chairman, but we are always concerned about what more we have to do. We have several hundred thousand more people. We're not giving up on any of the age groups. We're still trying to target 90% uh, uptake, and we've uh, good reason to believe that that will be achieved. However, we, with the recent JCVI advice, you'll understand that the program now has to, to really conserve its its steady supply of Pfizer. Um, we've had um, supply that's been steady, predictable, and uh, we're able to plan on the basis of it. But that means that because we're not be using very much of the AstraZeneca of that younger age population, it's now going to take us several more weeks to complete the program. So I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Patricia. And that was, that was very interesting, I have to say. And it is a really good example of our health service kicking in, doing what it does well. I have to say the, the level of data there is quite impressive as well. And I think local data is obviously key. And, and clearly, given this is a rolling program, that data will be invaluable in terms of tweaking and improving and all of that. So so that's all very, very, very welcome. And I suppose um, it, 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 it's a credit to, to everyone concerned that everyone involved, uh, I have to say. So a couple of quick ones from me before I go to members then. Given, given that space that we're in at the minute, is there any consideration be given through JCBA or, or yourselves in relation to bearing in mind that we're now starting to see, a, partly as a result of the successful vaccine program, some easements in the restrictions being possible? So in terms of frontline workers, say hospitality workers or transport workers, taxi drivers, bus, bus uh, operator, bus drivers or staff, is there any scope or capacity to include those people in, in the vaccine program at this stage, or is it being planned for? Uh, JCVI have continued to, to review all of these kind of issues, but we've had no further advice because for all four nations, we've dropped quite quickly through the age uh, ranges, and we're now at the 30 plus, I think they feel that it is just quicker for us to push down on through the age ranges. We expect uh, within a few weeks, uh, vaccine supply permitting, as I always qualify these answers with, um, that we will drop to the 18 years plus. So we'll get to everyone eventually. Um, however, where we think in a particular workplace, there may be a very low uptake, we will work with those employers to, to assist with that. Um, so th the, the the vaccine management system and the dashboard will allow us to target in that way. So if we think it's much more to do with locality, we think, um, and sometimes that locality, um, I'm thinking of um, you know the food packing industry, et cetera, the food production industry, that there may well be particular locations. And I know there's some initiatives planned between public health agency and the trusts uh, to do with that, but not specifically targeted um, at their um, specific jobs um, uh, per se, such as uh, uh, taxi drivers, etc. It, it's still largely age cohort at the moment. 
Okay, and and I do I do welcome your your attention to the around the food the the food processing and and the the vulnerability that that setting seems to to uh, be. I have many of those companies actually here in my own constituency, and also it's complicated, I suppose, by the fact that many of the workers are additionally that bit harder to reach, given that many of them will have come from other parts of the world to work here, English might be the first language and all of those issues. So I do, I would, I would like to see a continued focus on reaching out to, to those groups, so, so I'd welcome that. Okay, my second question then, and, and thank you for providing information back to us following your last appearance here in relation to the recruitment of vaccinators. And I suppose I'm very conscious now that, that uh, we're looking at, in some ways, having to do it all over again in terms of a booster, a booster vaccination and the pressure that that, that that will apply and particularly the pressure maybe that it will apply onto our GP network. Um, the other meeting that I was involved in last night, there was a, a number of health issues discussed, but one issue that was recurring over and over again was the difficulty and the concern about accessing GP appointments. So I, I got my own vaccine from my own GP, and I have to say it was an exemplary process. It couldn't have been easier, and, and the way it was arranged was absolutely a credit to them, um, I, I have to say. But it has to be disruptive for, for a general practice surgery to carry out that level of work. So I'm wondering, is the recruitment process ongoing in order to ensure that people who maybe aren't involved in other health services and are an additional resource and then therefore take the pressure off? Is that recruitment process continuing and are there ways to in fact ramp that up to take more and more pressure off those frontline services out there? Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, indeed it is. Uh, from the update that we provided with you, I'm, I'm looking at some figures in front of us. We've got additional people who are continuing to be recruited in. Um, we have uh, a number of them, as you know, directly support the GP vaccination program. And we're in, in um, very regular, I mean, several times a week, discussions with the GP leaders and representatives and, uh, and the primary care uh, team in the Health and Social Care Board. And it, it, it has to be of concern to us that um, the vaccination program has had an impact on those aspects of um, primary care. But I, I do want to reassure members that uh, GPs are very effective in delivering this. What we're hoping from JCVI is that when they give um, the advice on the booster, who will get it? It may not be a, a total population. Um, it will be a single dose. Um, and we hope that they will take into consideration the winter flu program, which is delivered by GPs. They deliver 480,000 uh, vaccinations every year, almost unseen, and, and it has not disrupted their normal practices. So we would hope there'll be that JCVI will come forward with a recommendation that will allow us to combine those so that it is much more effective. And GPs would be keen on that. And indeed, we discussed it last night at a meeting. Um, so we hope that that will be the case. But uh, as I said, we are continuing to recruit and we are continuing to deploy vaccinators. Okay, thank you, Patricia. And the final one for me then, the SSE has played a significant role at times in terms of of offering first, uh, first doses out to, to new cohorts and things like that. And given what was discussed there, the, the, the need for an additional booster, and I recognise that that will be uh, less in the sense that it will be a single rather than the, the double that you've undertaken at the minute. But are there any plans to, uh, and I'm, I'm very conscious of people in rural areas or people who with, with uh, mobility issues of travelling long distances at times, and I know many people are doing that and, and, and speak very highly of the way it's being done in the SSE, but are there any plans to put an SSE type facility west of the BAM to improve accessibility for people uh, in, that, in, that part of the, in that part of the North? Uh, well, uh, uh, Chairman, I had the pleasure of uh, attending the Foil Arena this week, um, and I've previously gone to Lakeland Forum and to the um, the centre at OMA. And what I would say is the these might be slightly smaller than the SSE, but they deliver in exactly the same way. There are large vaccination centres and they've been very effective. And I think anyone who attends there is impressed by how quietly efficient it is. It is not noisy, but you realise the industry that they're um, delivering, you know, 1,500 uh, vaccinations a day, typically in these um, centres. So they already exist. However, for the winter uh, campaign, I think GPs and community pharmacists are really going to carry the the, um, the the burden of that. 
I think the, the development we've had with community pharmacy, their access to the VMS means we can be quite targeted in how we work with them in targeting rural uh, communities and in, in some initiatives that would improve uptake. Um, we await final advice from JCVI about who to vaccinate. We don't know whether it's just going to be those priority groups one to four, one to six, um, whether it will be the same population for the flu vaccine or whether it's a total uh, uh, population. We do expect that there will be a staff vaccination program uh, because they will be particularly at risk um, as well as um, whatever part of the population. So we hope that advice will be uh, coming to us soon. We expect it no later than um, early summer. So by July, we hope that we will have that advice uh, because it comes, it comes all too quickly um, that they're asking us to begin in the autumn again. So okay, I, yeah. okay, yeah, and, and I do, and I do accept and appreciate that that those centres are also excellent. My point is, SSE has had availability at an earlier stage than the rest of the north. Can that be facilitated? Given those centres are quite capable and competent, can we look at a situation where, when it's released early to some cohorts in the SSE, that we also have a centre identified west of the ban that can that can similarly start that rollout early? Well, I think we'll plan a chair on the basis of what JCVI asks us to do. And, and and if it requires something like that, that's what we'll put in place. Um, but I think it's unlikely that they will go for um, s such large centres next time, uh, wherever they are. I mean, the, the, um, the early availability in SSE is quite a stressful thing for the team involved because the early availability is usually where they start to see their bookings dry up and they've got a lot of vaccinators who are there. They have vaccine at times and uh, they don't easily have anyone to vaccinate. So it's been it's been a, a sort of balance between providing that um, uh, access to an early appointment, but also carefully managing your vaccine supply. Um, but we don't even know what vaccine we're going to be using in the in the autumn either. Um, so that's yeah. all to advise. But we certainly take that. Uh, I mean, bear that what you've uh, said in mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, re the regional the regional balance is is a, is a key factor for for people who find it more difficult. So that's 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 great. Thank you. I'm going to go across to members then. So at this point in time, I'm going first of all to our deputy chair Pam Cameron, then Carol McKillen. Paula Bradshaw, Jerry Carroll, and then Arlea Flynn in that order. So uh, that's who I have at the present time. I'm going then to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Patricia, again, for, for coming to committee. And thank you for this incredible rollout. I think we're all very proud of, of the work that you, um, the staff, and indeed the volunteers are doing and uh, throughout the centres. Uh, and certainly my experience at, at Ballymena um, has been terrific. So thank you for that. And I also want to thank you, Patricia, as well, for, for answering the, the more complex queries that we send through to you. Uh, you're very prompt to coming back, and I, I think that's uh, a wonderful reassurance for people. Uh, it's good for constituents who have got in touch with us. Um, in terms of the rollout, could you give us um, an, an indication, if you have one, uh, to an indicative timeline for the vaccination of the, the entirety of the adult population first? Um, and then I wanted to ask you if there are any um, signs coming from JCVI in, in the round um, approval for a vaccine for under 16s. Okay, uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, uh, the timeline, our original timeline had been that we would have hoped first doses would have been completed by June. I think with the revised advice about the under 30s, that has meant that that will push into the end of July, we now think, or um, well into July. Um, and uh, depending on what our vaccine supply will be like in August, um, we are able to bring forward the dose interval. So we will try and complete the program by the end of August for second doses. So we're still within that time frame. It, as I said, it was disappointing to a lot um, of individuals involved that had pushed out that, that number of weeks, but we still think it's within our original time frame. Um, the uh, uh, JCVI, um, it, it's actually MHRA uh, that will give the approvals. And uh, I'm aware that they continually look at the data um, there are exceptional cases where someone under the age of 16 can be prescribed a vaccination off license, but that's usually a matter 
of recommendation from their pediatrician and in consultation with parents where that would be the case. And it's a very, very small number and is done in an exceptional circumstance. Um, so uh, we uh, there had been, as you may be aware, a study that um, where AstraZeneca was um, looked at for younger uh, below the age of 16. Uh, that study isn't complete and in fact, I think may have been suspended um, pending, I think, um, further consideration. But uh, we've had no advice yet around Pfizer. I'm aware that some other countries have licensed below the age of 16, I think down to the age of 12, but the MHRA have not yet done that, but I'm sure they will consider it. Okay, that's great. And that, that leads me nicely on to uh, kind of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, can, can you give us the updated guidance around um, pregnant and breastfeeding mothers? Um, and also, can you, can you address the issue of, of um, uh, that hesitancy maybe around the, the younger cohort, cohorts, um, particularly around? information or the, or the apathy and that, that, that may be out there in terms of um, their need to actually take up the vaccine when they see they're themselves not personally at risk. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, if I start with those that are pregnant and breastfeeding, um, you will be aware there was revised advice. I think they were, uh, those who are pregnant um, were seen as particularly at risk from COVID-19. And in fact, there have been some uh, rather sad cases uh, uh, around the world and in the UK where um, there have been um, uh, serious illness and death for pregnant mothers. So the, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have, I think, uh, considered this very carefully and with JCVI now recommended that um, individuals uh, should be vaccinated. But it's usually a conversation and, and for Northern Ireland, what we're recommending is someone at their when they're booking in with the midwife um, that they have the conversation about the risks for themselves. Uh, most of the hesitancy, and I would think anyone who's pregnant uh, feels they're carrying very precious cargo. Therefore, they they feel they 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 have more than their own life to consider in this, and they and they deal with it very carefully. So those are important conversations. And then having had that conversation, they can book on the the revised JCB advice is that they would also have um, Pfizer or a messenger RNA vaccine, and therefore they will be vaccinated if uh, um, if they do come forward within the vaccination centers. So um, it, it ties in very nicely with the second part of your question, which was around vaccine hesitancy, because I think those who are pregnant and breastfeeding, for all the reasons I've given, do take um, time to consider this. And, and uh, we, uh, the public health agency did an omnibus survey and in fact NISRA did an omnibus survey and which seemed to indicate that 90% uh, or just over of those who had not yet been vaccinated that they sampled said they would come forward for vaccination and when they looked at the reasons why someone may not come forward and why they're being hesitant it was mainly on safety grounds. So therefore, we think, um, you know, conversations with their GP, conversations with people they trust, conversations with um, if they have a specific health issue, I think are always of value when you are concerned. And I think and the more that we're able to kind of publish, um, um, you know, kind of data and reassurances from those that are trusted figures, I think, and influencers, I think the more we can address that issue of, of hesitancy. But um, and what you say about the JCV advice is absolutely correct. It's when they look at the balance for younger people who are not particularly at risk of coronavirus, there's always exceptions, but are not at high risk, at times when the transmission levels are lower, that them becoming vaccinated is a benefit to society and to other people. Therefore, the risk benefit is, is different at times of high transmission when their chances of catching it and their chances are greater. They're protecting themselves as well as protecting other people. So it felt that on the balance of risk, it was better to provide them with a vaccine that had the lowest level of risk for them, albeit that the AZ risk is an exceptional, exceptionally rare. Um, but that was the basis of the advice that was um, revised uh, recently. That's brilliant. Thank you for that clarity, Patricia. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I'm going to Carol Nicholin. Go ahead, Carol, please. 
really, really impressive figures from the graphs. Um, so just like everybody else, I just want to commend everybody involved in the vaccination process. Patricia, I'm trying to find out if the department under JVZI or whatever uh, uh, guidelines that we're operating, that all people that are presently living in the North are entitled to receive a vaccination regardless of their residency or their immigration status. That's my first question. And if they are, I think it would be worthwhile uh, to check the porthole um, regarding the information because I've had some discussions with people and they find it a bit of confused, confusion. So, for example, I'm in that eligible to use a vaccine service on the porthole. And basically what it says is if you live in Northern Ireland and are entitled to treatment by the health service, you can book a vaccine. Um, have you been invited to do so? But there is a bit of confusion around this, and I'm, I'm caveating that with this, that I'm not talking about people who are specifically coming here for a vaccination. I'm talking about people's residency and particularly asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, thank you very much. Indeed, we've considered this and, and have been planning this for some time. They are absolutely entitled to uh, been vaccinated. Um, and but they wouldn't be vaccinated through that. Uh, we don't expect them to book through the portal. Um, we will have either outreach teams or we will have a separate mechanism where we'll, we where the trust will book them in to the vaccination centres because they won't have a health and care number. They may not have a GP and that would exclude them. So public health agency are very aware of these groups and these individuals. So they were vaccinated by the mobile teams. And indeed, there. I think this weekend there's a group of of fishermen who are residents. But uh, you can imagine um, uh, that 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 changes from time to time. And they're being vaccinated. And uh, again, with the homeless, and there has been specific targeted within uh, that group and for the migrant population, asylum seekers, and including those who've been refused asylum. Um, we have a responsibility to vaccinate them and the public health agency are very aware of who they are. And as I said, working very closely with the trust teams to provide um, uh, mobile uh, vaccinations to them. Uh, Trish, that's great news because there have been concerns, um, some concerns and I appreciate the fact that you said there's going to be greater clarification because people have struggled to find um, you know, if it fits for them, like, for example, people who are stuck here, like students who are maybe just come, came here, got stuck, um, it would be helpful if that information went out to, for example, student unions. And again, if the health um, promotion agency were to do actually a specific targeted uh, information campaign, um, because the last thing we want is that after such a successful vaccination program, particularly for people who want to be vaccinated uh, and probably feel if they looked at the information on the web at the minute, they may feel that it doesn't apply to them. So any clarification would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I want to be clear. We're not yet dropped to the age for the average student. So um, we, we have vaccinated um, several people who are were caught in Northern Ireland during the pandemic. What we don't want to encourage is people to travel here for their vaccination. Yeah. Uh, um, but we will when and and that's a good suggestion about student unions when we come to that age group and we certainly think the messaging there. And, and I appreciate Patricia. Most students are you know very young, but there are mature students who have came here for masters and PhDs who would certainly fit into the age cohort, um, aren't registered with the GP, and find themselves stuck in that position. So any information that could be given out to them and in a very clear way would be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen and Patricia. And going then to Paula Bradshaw, go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patricia, for your um, update this morning. Um, just to go, um, follow on from Carol's point there, um, I have a lot of constituents in South Belfast who um, are moving here from England, are registered with a GP, and also then the, the cohort that you were just mentioning there. I, I, I always struggle to find information on the Public Health Agency's website to direct my IT 
tend to send them just to that contact number. But again, you have to hook about for it. So if we can get that a wee bit more prominent, that'd be appreciated. Um, the, the, the main issue I was going to raise with you today was um, a complaint I had received from a constituent who is um, registered blind and requires information to be presented in Braille. And as you know, at the, after you get your vaccination, you're given that information leaflet. Um, he asked for this, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't given it. It was given his assistant, was given the um, written format. He asked for a complaint. Now, he was very aggrieved at, at the way he felt that he'd been treated. Um, and again, that was in written format. So is there any chance you could be looking at um, providing that information in Braille? It's my first real question. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Paula. Um, uh, I think I'm aware of this. I'm aware of this complaint, and I do know the public health agency. We're looking at this, and we're working with um, um, RNIB to look at how they could improve those services. So I don't have a specific answer to that complaint now, but I do know that it's under investigation, and I'm very disappointed if, if anyone with that lack of access um, can't can't progress through the vaccination program. So. Certainly pick that up. Um, pick that up at the HIT team. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the second question would be people who have been in sort of long, medium, long term stays in hospitals. So whenever the vaccination was happening at the start, um, they were too frail, or the, the clinician said they weren't ready for it, um, and then that stopped. And then they're saying, "Well, you can get it with your GP." And then the GPs are saying, "Well, we're no longer providing that service." So um, and they're not doing outreach. Uh, I suppose, it, it, is there, are the GPs allowed a degree of flexibility to, of the degree to which they're actually providing um, outreach service to um, constituents who've maybe been in hospital, for example? Well, we wouldn't expect GPs to outreach to hospitals. Um, oh, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I meant uh, to people's homes, apologies to people's homes. Oh, yes. The, the, uh, Patricia, yeah. Patricia. Patricia, just just before you before you answer, Patricia, your sound has dipped a wee bit. There was a wee oh. slight drop out of times on it, but it's got a wee bit worse. So if you could just be conscious of that, maybe, and uh, just just uh, maybe just be aware of that and try to uh, maybe if you have a headset, it might it might help. But let's see how it, how it goes. But uh, there was a slight drop in your quality there. Uh, apologies for that. There, I'm in the Department of Health, and it was a variable internet signal. So I think that's responsible. Uh, if I go back, um, GPs do have a program working with district nursing for those who are housebound, so they can outreach. Um, but you will realise that for some people who are in hospital, they become anxious about getting sometimes their second dose rather than their first dose. Um, the, the recommended dose interval is between 8 and 12 weeks, but there's a degree of flexibility, particularly if they have AstraZeneca, that it's very safe to have it and, in fact, advantageous to have it at the longer interval. Um, our, we've worked with um, the hospital uh, staff and who will sometimes advise us that individuals are, if they're in hospital, uh, the typical length of stay is shorter now, but for those who are in a bit longer, that the hospital themselves will either try to provide that vaccination. But the advice that we have given them is that um, if it is a short to medium stay, that they should let them be picked up by their general practitioner. Um, and it's only if they're longer stay that they then need to put arrangements in place to have them vaccinated within uh, the trust themselves. And I believe trusts have been doing that. Um, but um, I've previously briefed about some of the difficulties that once a vial is punctured, you have a short period of time to use um, a, a, the, the 10 doses that are within it. So often in the planning of it, they need to look at having a number of people to vaccinate around the same time. Otherwise, we get unacceptable levels of wastage. So trust will then trend and, uh, and collect the individuals um, so that they're able to administer that uh, in an efficient way. Um, but it is kept under continuous review, but I could understand anyone feeling anxious about this. You. You, you, you put up the graph or the um, statistics there around the ethnic background of people who've been vaccinated, and obviously um, they, they were the total number. Um, how are you interrogating that to actually look at the percentage per ethnic group um, to allow you then for better targeting and making sure that um, there's not a skewing then towards people who would be of a, a white background, so to speak. Thank you. 
uh, thank you. It's our public health colleagues who are looking at this and giving us advice on it. So they will look at what the the, the breakdown. You did see that there was that section that said undeclared, and uh, that does complicate it. Um, it's where individuals choose not to answer that question or have not yet. We have not yet had information um, on that. Um, so uh, it's where we know for certain what the um, the size of that population is, and we and uh, sometimes that is not always the case. Um, but where we have some certainty, at least we will have an idea of the kind of percentage um, around that group. I, I think the uh, when I also showed that same slide earlier from the the um, dashboard. Um, I think some of the geography of this is, is terribly important because some of the targeting can can be uh, particular populations within a geographical area. And I know that some of the very successful programs that have been planned in the past, um, often within a, a particular ethnic group, will look at senior members of the ethnic group, those who've got uh, credibility with the group uh, are, are going to be better um, uh, role models uh, for inspiring kind of confidence um, in the vaccination program. Uh, so I, I, our public health colleagues are looking at all of those factors and doing some very fine grained analysis. It wouldn't normally be. Um, we're the kind of delivery arm of that and uh, and try and make sure that, it, that the vaccinations actually take place. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Patricia. Okay, going there to Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry Lidahol, go right. Um, thanks, Trisha. Um I, I got my first dose at the weekend at the SSE, and there was a it was a surreal but a very impressive operation. So thanks to thanks everybody involved in that. Um, just two questions, really. Uh, the first is: Is there any evidence, Patricia, of um, of people I suppose letting their guard down after getting their their vaccine? Um, because there's a period of the three weeks before the the effectiveness really kicks in. Um, is it the antibodies or, or whatever the, the kind of scientific reason uh, for it is? Um, so is there, is there any evidence of people who have got a vaccine and have been uh, either contracted um, um, sort of the virus or have kind of um, been hospitalized or, or been um, sort of negatively uh, impacted? Is there any data or any, any evidence uh, towards that? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I wouldn't have that data, but I do know uh, CMO and others look at this very carefully. I think there's been a very low level of hospitalizations, but however, that that's just from what I've heard others say rather than my direct evidence, um, that a very low level um, of uh, hospital admissions, etc., after uh, vaccination. Um, but um, because it does take time, as you say, to build immunity, um, Often people get vaccinated. It's a more emotional experience than they expect it to be. And they, they're taking a step towards that personal safety. Uh, and uh, and it's very easy to feel that you are therefore a, a bit less vulnerable than you were before. So um, it becomes relief. And it's only human nature that people do, I think, uh, let their let their guard down slightly. But we, we have always given this very cautious message about making sure you need to get your second dose, you need the immunity. Although there's good evidence that you get a level of immunity from the first vaccination, but it grows over time and you want to have the highest possible standard to, to be able to live, uh, the, the enjoy some of the, the freedoms that I think are recently um, uh, been allowed to us. So um, I, I don't have that, but I'm sure there's others, particularly from the chief scientific officer and others that will be able to provide that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we would, we need to see that. Hopefully it is low as you indicated, but um, I think we need to keep an eye on it. And, and I think it is inevitable, or understandable rather, that people kind of let their guard down. But I think we need to reiterate the message that people are certainly uh, protected, but not immune, uh, even especially that three-week period uh, after getting their first dose. Um, just my final question, um, kind of follows up with, with what Paula, um, and as was Carl said, I think we need to get a, a breakdown of the, the percentage of people from the ethnic minority backgrounds uh, and the percentage of um, uh, vaccine uptake for, for adults. Um, and hopefully they're, they're similar for um, people who are not from those backgrounds, but if there's a discrepancy, there would be uh, an issue there. Uh, and also do we have any indication 
uh, or could we get the data around the percentage of refugees and asylum seekers around uh, how many and what percentage of those uh, communities have received uh, their uh, vaccine? I think that would be very helpful because I mean, there's these are communities that are obviously very uh, isolated or vulnerable. Um, there's been histories of uh, in different countries in the state kind of experimenting on people's bodies in a really uh, despicable way. So there, in some ways, there's, there's a natural uh, uh, distrust, but I think we need to uh, do extra work to target people who have um, maybe misconceptions or uh, grievances. So, uh, uh, any clarity that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I think for all the reasons that you said, I've seen the evidence around uh, where there would be mistrust of anything related to a state or a or um, a, a, an, an organisation. Um, so it does take a, a particularly sensitive approach. Uh, our public health colleagues are very aware of that. Um, I don't have that information, but we can get that information to you. It's now become more available because of the refinements and that recently made in the vaccine management system. We wouldn't have had that up to this point. And, and I suppose it reflects where we are in the program. Uh, what I mentioned earlier um, around vaccine equity, it's at this point we want to be very careful that we are not, when we've got very high uptake levels that may uh, and indeed will um, uh, disguise the fact that there's lower uptake in particular vulnerable groups so yes that that's the kind of analysis that's, that's underway at the moment and when that's available i will ask that that's provided okay thank you thank you jerry and going to our leah flynn go ahead or leah please um thank you chair and thanks patricia uh, maybe just to follow on a wee bit um patricia from that um that point you made around so that that additional analysis that's being done at the minute and that that data that you showed us earlier um, is very useful and I'll maybe take a wee look at that in more detail when I get a chance. But I'm just wondering, following on from um, the points that other members have made, is the is the the, the department and the vaccination programme um, also, you know, um, keeping an eye out for any sort of um, trends around the levels of uptake um, between the, the most deprived communities and the least deprived? Because um, I'm just conscious we, we have a briefing after this session with the um, health officials around health inequalities. And do you know what I mean? We know all the difficulties that, you know, um, some of the areas that, that are in greatest deprivation um, face. And um, I'm just conscious that um, to, to be mindful of that and to try and I don't know if you are trying to monitor that. And would that be part of your that wider analysis you were talking about, Patricia? It very much. Thank you very much. Yes, it would be part of that wider analysis. And what, what I've seen is that they've looked at these super output areas. Mm -hmm. So they've looked at the, the, the most deprived and least deprived, and they've looked at, and uh, I think the early indications are that in the older age group, there's no difference, um, but there a, a difference starts to emerge in the as you drop down below 50. And now that may be about how quickly people come forward. Um, it may be accessibility. Um, and therefore, some of the, those kind of plans that have been put in place, for example, for pop-up clinics, uh, if you identify a particular area that has very low level of uptake um, and you know that you work with community pharmacy, you work with the mobile teams and you try and target that area. So that's the work that's underway. As I said, it's the our health protection teams in the public health agency are uh, really crawling all over this and making sure that if they can identify uh, areas and they are i think um uh, that we want to make sure that we get them covered in and uh, offer opportunities for vaccination so yes um that's an important part of that analysis no that, that's good to know patricia that's great because i'm just conscious i mean even in the constituency that myself and jerry represent in west belfast and carl in north belfast you know if if we the earlier that you know that those numbers are sort of worked out and yet you have that data then it makes us it makes it easier for us to go out alongside the local community groups the local pharmacies the local gp practices know to so we can all try and do as much as we can because i think you're right when you do go down into the you know the younger age groups i think it might be a bit more difficult to get some of the younger ones motivated you know to actually go and get that vaccine so the sooner you have that and anything that we can do to, to help um absolutely um and then just then my final question when you were speaking earlier around the so the vaccination for the under 30s and um obviously the advice was that, that, that they won't receive um the astrazeneca so the 
I know you're you're probably aiming for I think you mentioned July to have the July August to have the the under thirties um vaccinated. So at the minute, and I know you're probably unsure about supplies until you actually have them, you know, here physically. But are you expecting then the Moderna vaccine coming next month? And is that what you are planning for, um, for that vaccination program of the the um, eighteen plus? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are expecting uh, Moderna um, next month, in the middle of next month. Um, but it, they, um, the under 30s can also get Pfizer. Uh, the advice, to be clear, is that uh, where it's possible, that it's offered. I mean, uh, younger people can also still uh, take AstraZeneca um, if they understand those risks and those are explained to them and they consent. Uh, and indeed, many younger people have already had it with um, uh, very safely. Um, we are expecting Moderna. We will be using Pfizer. And uh, when we release um, uh, slots at vaccination centres, including the SSE, we do it uh, uh, one or two weeks at a time uh, as we're certain about our vaccine supply. Uh, you know, we've always, um, we don't store it. We, we use it as quickly as we get it in. So once we're absolutely certain about the supply coming in, we open up the slots uh, accordingly. So it means it's a bit frustrating for people. So people are very fast in getting booked and it takes others a little bit longer. Um, so um, that will be um, available right through uh, June and into July. Okay, thanks very much, Patricia. Wish you all the best over the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arlea. Um, and going now across to Alan Chambers. Um, Alan, can you uh, come on, go ahead with your question there, please? Thank you, Chairman. Are you hearing me okay? I am, Alan. Funny, I'm not seeing you today, but I am hearing you loud and clear. So you, you look rather pix you look rather pixelated on my screen, but I'm sure your question will be nonetheless uh, su succinct yeah. and, and direct. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Patricia, I suppose it's uh, it's easy for all of us on the, the outside looking in to concentrate purely on the, the stats of, of this operation, but I think it's, it's easy to forget that uh, there's a huge logistical operation with, with many people involved over and above the actual uh, uh, vaccinators. And it certainly has been a great team effort. And during the week there, I visited um, a community pharmacy in Bangor uh, uh, along with the minister. And um, the lead pharmacist there, a young lady, was uh, telling us that uh, uh, after a, a day of vaccinating, she, she goes home absolutely buzzing. Uh, with the excitement of, of being part of all this, uh, and there certainly does seem to be a great spirit of positivity uh, around. I was also very impressed to hear about the sort of unique uh, computer program that you have developed to keep track of who actually has been vaccinated, and I understand that that's going to be able to be deployed uh, for the vaccination, the flu vaccination program going forward. But just my question is, uh, do you have any sense that there is uh, resistance um, in any of the cohorts to being vaccinated. And, and what sort of reasons are, are, are people maybe putting forward? And, and what can you do to reassure those that are maybe undecided about getting uh, vaccinated? And what would you say in terms of, of the negative impact on the whole community uh, by those who refuse to be vaccinated? And, what would your sort of your your tabletop exercises? What sort of percentage of the community do you feel at the end of all this will not have been vaccinated for various reasons? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alan. Um, uh, I, I think that um, when I showed the slide earlier, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see it uh, uh, clearly at that stage. We've got very high percentage. Uh, you know, ninety-seven, ninety-eight percent in the um, over 50s and uh, over 60s. So we, we know that they are interested in their health, they understand the risks to themselves and they're and they're stepping forward. And we find that right across all the those um, uh, social groups. Um, it's, as we drop to younger people, I think um, the reasons are, 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 are different because they don't perceive the risk to themselves to be as great, therefore their motivation around it is less. Um, the surveys that have been undertaken have suggested that uh, some of the concerns are around uh, health. Uh, you will know that there will always be a number of individuals who are on principle uh, opposed vaccination. 
um, and you will never be able to, I think, easily uh, persuade them um, otherwise. However, sometimes it's the impact that um, their messages have on those who are a bit hesitant. It can frighten them more and it can make them more uncertain. So um, they, they do come forward. We find as we've gone through the age ranges, people come forward eventually as we've gone through the numbers click up over time. So sometimes it's just a process uh, for them to take that time uh, to have that reassurance. Um, some of the public health agency messaging around this is very, very important where they've been able to directly challenge some of that messaging around the anti um, uh, messaging with misinformation or pseudoscience around it, um, that is frightening individuals. And we believe at the very beginning, anecdotally from what was been said by the vaccination teams, we believe that younger women were, come, were a bit more hesitant to come forward. Um, and since we've done some further analysis on the vaccine management system, we now know that women overall in every age group are outstripping men uh, and they are coming forward. So they, they, the messaging is now pivoting to target men and they're starting to look at through, um, uh, you know, rugby clubs, GAA, um, the, 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 you know, those areas where individuals will have, um, you know, um, more appropriate uh, kind of models. So you should start to see some of that in the coming weeks. I think they're launching a campaign starting on Monday, um, which I hope will have uh, uh, um, an impact on, on that, on uptake. But um, it's, it's, it's not new news to know that men are, are more hesitant about their health and a bit slower to come forward in all aspects of health. So um, I'm very reassured to find so many men on the committee have said they've had their vaccination. Um, I think that's very good, good role modeling, I think, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. And uh, just, just to flag up there that some of the sound issues Patricia has had is as, actually as a result of members' microphones. So on some occasions, broadcasting will mute you, and that's the reason for it. It's to improve the sound. Um, so just moving on then to our last question this morning, I think it's coming from Cara Hunter. So go ahead, Cara, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Patricia, for being here again this morning. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to, to really thank you and uh, celebrate the hard work and the commitment um, to the vaccination rollout. Um, uh, a number of points that I have here have been touched on already um, by previous members, uh, but I do have a keen interest uh, on those who are homeless. I'm mindful there's 1,200 uh, homeless people that are known um, and I'm just wondering uh, where we are with that. I had seen, I believe it was in March it had commenced around vaccinating the homeless so if you could just give us an update on that that would be grateful. I'd be grateful. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, our public health agency colleagues again have led on this. They have winter flu campaigns that are successful with the homeless and they have been vaccinating with the district nursing. They've been out vaccinating the homes. I think they've got through all their first doses. They're now, uh, I think they're very well aware that sometimes you only get people for a first dose and uh, th there will be some movements and therefore more difficult to track them for the second dose. Um, so they've used AstraZeneca vaccine because it develops over time and strengthens immunity over time. And if you're only going to get one dose, that's probably the right vaccine uh, to get. Um, we are not yet at the end of second doses, so it'll be interesting to see what the outcome of that will be and how many finally do get their second dose. But they'll have a significant level of protection um, uh, uh, to date. So, I, I mean, they're, they're building on the very good work that's gone before from the, the flu vaccination program and that kind of more trusting relationship that, that builds up uh, with, the, with the homeless. But they will be a particularly vulnerable population. I think that we, we uh, realised very early on we needed to think about carefully about how we captured them. So, yes, uh, we're underway. That's very helpful, Patricia. Thank you. Um, uh, also, I just have a question around as we approach uh, the younger age groups, um, I'm 25, so it won't be long until hopefully uh, I can get my own vaccine. Uh, I'm just looking at the trends there with uptake. Um, do you foresee any issues with uptake uh, or, or what do you foresee happening? Uh, I, I, I do expect that um, the message is harder as you get younger um, because as we know young people are less affected by COVID-19. They're not unaffected. They do get ill. They do get long COVID. They do get into hospital. 
but it's much rarer than those who are older. Um, so I think it's, uh, and it's quite clear that there has to be a different kind of message to them because it, yes, it is for their own protection, but it's also for the protection of others that younger people get vaccinated. And therefore, again, the revised JCVI advice around the choice of vaccine that, that would be offered to younger people is going to be important. So we will want to be, strengthen the messages around the safety of the vaccine, strengthen the messages around the importance of being vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm not going to be too cynical at the moment and say that some of the requirements that airlines have um, in uh, uh, providing evidence of being vaccinated may have an impact um, on younger people who may feel disadvantaged if they are not uh, vaccinated. But from our point of view, it's a voluntary. It must always remain, I think, uh, a voluntary for younger people um, and, uh, and therefore they need to understand um, both the risks of themselves and the benefits to themselves of being vaccinated. But they're looking for good role models, um, again, to uh, demonstrate that it is um, a wise and uh, helpful thing to do. Thank you. Um, and just lastly there, uh, I appreciate the Chair's comments earlier around concern around west of the ban and accessibility to the vaccine. Uh, recently I had spoken with a constituent uh, in East Derry who had stated uh, the GPs were struggling with um, supply and shortages uh, and they have been told um, to give out uh, second vaccines uh, as there's a shortage uh, in supply. And I'm just wondering, I know it's quite a, quite a broad question, um, but where are we with uh, concern for supply down the line? Uh, well, we've always had issues around supply from the very start of the program, and GPs are vaccinating with AstraZeneca, um, and we had particular supply issues during March and into April. Those are easing in May. Uh, I think GPs have to deliver. Uh, you, you've seen from the earlier um, uh, bar chart uh, for GPs, they are delivering actively second doses at the moment. They've got a responsibility to deliver those second doses. But uh, within those areas, there's still access to the community pharmacy, there's still access to foil arena, there's still access to other opportunities to be vaccinated for individuals. GPs were only vaccinating down to the 50 year olds and those that were clinically vulnerable. So it may be anyone younger that just would not um, normally um, be vaccinated by their GP. However, now that we're at the stage of saying, is anyone missed here? Um, does anyone prefer, uh, feel safer being vaccinated by the GP? So we have asked the GPs uh, to look uh, when, they've, when they've gone through all their second doses, which will be completed in the next few weeks, to then look through, um, because they can look up anyone, they can look at their, their patients. There is a, a what they call a right back system from the vaccine management system into the clinic, GP clinical systems. So they can check who has not been vaccinated and they can offer, particularly those that maybe um, over the age of 40 who have not come forward that they believe should have. And it, maybe that's the final um, mm -hmm. invitation that someone needs to feel the confidence of being vaccinated. So we're trying to put as many safety systems in place and as many opportunities as possible. Sometimes individuals have to be asked half a dozen times before they finally say, yes, I'm going to go and do this. Um, and that's that's what we're trying to make sure happens in every case. Thank you, Patricia. That really helps kind of clarify those points. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. OK, thank you, Cara. And thank you once again, Patricia, for coming along to the committee this morning and for your continued engagement with the committee. I think that has been really useful and I think has been uh, useful for us in terms of getting the information uh, hearing the perceptions and the, and the difficulties and the successes and all of that. But also I think it's a useful vehicle for us to reflect a number of concerns as representatives. And I do also want to welcome your engagement with representatives. And I think that has all transferred into what has been a very reactive and a very uh, engaging process. And, and that's that's great. So I wish you and your, your uh, very hard working team all the very best in the time ahead as you continue rolling out this uh, vaccination program to protect us individually, our families and our communities and I want to wish you all the best at the time ahead. Gormi Agat Patricia Agus Slango Boyle. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. Members, I would just like to tack back slightly to the issue earlier in relation to the uh, the the group that we met, the birth mothers for justice, birth mothers and their babies for justice. Just to say, would members agree that we in on on foot of that a uh, 
concerns issue that Paula is pulling together for us to drop that meeting that we would write to Judith Gillespie as chair of the independent inter interdepartmental working group to reflect the concerns. Um, and while I recognize that there are many different groups out there and there are many different individuals, all who will have to greater or lesser extent issues and, and concerns, but that where we pick up on those concerns, we reflect those on to uh, the interdepartmental working group. So would members be content to be right to, to the interdepartmental working group and the Department of Health just flagging up those concerns and asking them to, uh, I'm conscious we are going to be receiving some further briefings on that and we can pick up on the issues there, but I think in the meantime, it will be a good idea to capture and forward those concerns. Members content? Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, so I'm going to take a short break there just before we go into our session on health inequalities. Could members come back for 10.50? So an eight-minute break there and back for 10.50. Thank you, members. And Clerk, could you take us out of broadcasting temporarily, please? That's a slide now, Chair. Okay, thank you, members. So we will now resume uh, our um, health committee meeting this morning, and we're moving on to item six, which is a departmental briefing on health inequalities. So uh, I can advise members that officials from the Department of Health are here to brief the committee on the work of the department in this area. I refer members to a copy of the latest departmental health inequalities report, which is a tab 6.1 of your pack there. So I would now like to welcome to our meeting this morning, Mr. Gary Maxwell, who's head of health development uh, policy branch in the department. Can you hear us okay, Gary? Hi, hi everybody. Yes, I can hear you fine. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, we're hearing you there, Gary. Thank you. We're also joined by Mr. Bill Stewart, who is a principal statistician with the a principal statistician in the department. Can you hear us, Bill? I can, yes. And Mr. Keelan Lafferty, who's a deputy principal statistician. Can you hear us okay, Keelan? Yes, I can, sir. Okay, well, to fault your off, Doctor, uh, thank you, and uh, you're all very welcome to our meeting here this morning. So I'll go back to you, Gary, then. Would you go ahead, please, and brief the committee, and then we'll take some questions from members. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, Bill is going to run through a presentation, first of all, on the, the um, most recent inequalities report, um, and then we can run through questions from there, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not hearing Bill at present. I'm wondering, is he just teeing up the presentation, maybe, and he hasn't got back online yet? But sorry, yes, I'm sorry, yes, I'm just I'm trying to put bring up this screen here. So, no problem, no problem, uh, Bill. I let you know once we once we see it. Right, that's you, Bill. Hi. Hopefully that's she we had now. Yes, that's us seeing it now. Just before you start, Bill, um, uh, if everyone could bear in mind, if you have access to a headset, that's usually better quality sound. And if members can put themselves onto mute when they're not contributing, that also helps with our sound quality. So go ahead, Bill, uh, with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, my name is Bill Stewart. Um, I head up public health information and research branch within the department. And um, Part of our remit is to look at um, health inequalities, um, you know, statistics, and basically I'm going to just take you through the, um, the most recent annual report, which was published uh, about a month ago. Um, just a quick note before I um, go into the presentation that um, the findings in this report take us up to the um, pre the pandemic. We haven't have, have an, um, any figures through yet, which have shown how inequalities have changed over that time. Um, okay. So some background on the uh, on on the work that we do. Um, all the, all in the call, the statistical work is housed under what is called Northern Northern Ireland Health and Social Care's Inequality Monitoring System, HSCIMS for short. And um, basically, it has over and I over it was set up in two thousand and three, um, and it and I has over fifty indicators, um, which cover a variety of different issues involving mortality population health and um, HSC service usage. Um, it is based on quality administrative data um, and because it's an area-based system, we can't use survey data. 
Um, so the quality admin data well, as I referred to there would be things like um, the patient administration system or um, registered births data. Uh, it's um, so it basically it, it reports on regional level inequality gaps, also gaps within um, trust areas and inequalities within LGDs as well. Um, it's used for a variety of other different work purposes, uh, such as generating area profiles for community groups or, or councils if they ask for them. Uh, that may involve looking at district electoral area. Um, it also feeds into a number of the, the key sort of departmental strategies and formal indicators. And also we, um, there's a number of PFG indicators which are collected and collated through this system. Um, the, the regional, or the, so the inequalities report itself is not the only output from HSCMS. Um, we also produce a life expectancy report um, on an annual basis, which uses a statistical um, technique known as life table decomposition, which allows us to look at changes in life expectancy over time or across areas and break it down into the, the contributing mortality causes or um, contributing age groups, which is useful information. We also um, produce an annual sort of progress report for making life better strategy, um, which looks at not only health indicators, but also um, the social determinants of health. And we have, on an ad hoc basis now recently, we've produced a COVID inequalities report. Now it doesn't report in any of the, the indicators that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, it's solely, um, uh, it's been two to date and it's reported on um, uh, COVID admissions, COVID deaths and testing data. We're hoping to run one again soon for an update and, um, and, and also include vaccination data if we can get our hands on it. Okay, so a wee bit more about the, um, the methodology that we use within the report. Um, as I said, it's area based and that area that we use is some super output areas. So there's 890 of those in Northern Ireland. Um, that's our building block. So we categorize each area by its relative ranking uh, according to the 2017 multiple deprivation measure. And then that we can identify the 20% most deprived areas and 20% least deprived areas. Um, and also if we're looking at sub-regional we can look at the most deprived within those areas as well. Um, a lot of the indicators that we, we report on are age standardized. Um, and what that means essentially is that we take um, into account um, differences in size and age structure within populations and population over time. Um, that just removes any sort of um, noise around the data and, um, and sort of and effects that sort of, you know, maybe different demographics would have such as if you had an area which was more elderly, um, you would probably expect it to have higher mortality, so we control for that. And it means that the, the, the gaps are literally sort of, you know, um, are, are based on, are more realistic. Um, so we also, so the actual inequality gap we report on is, um, is a percentage difference between the most deprived health outcome and the least deprived outcome, health outcome at a regional level apart from if we're looking at the life expectancy sort of um, family of indicators, then we report on sort of um, the actual years difference. And the sub-regional difference is, is defined as the most deprived areas within that trust or LGD um, compared with the trust or LGD average. We don't use least deprived areas in this one because the numbers are getting quite small and the, um, the comparisons are, tend to become a bit less robust. Okay, sorry, I'm back to you, Sorry. Um, so I'm just going like, to take a quick run through the, um, the sort of um, the general findings report, and I'll just do it by chapter. So on each page you, or each slide, you can see I refer to the, the actual pages in the report. So the, um, for life expectancy and, and general health, that's on page 14 to 16 of the report. Um, so there was no change to any, any of the gaps in this section. So this covers life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, and disability-free life expectancy over the last five years. I'm gonna say, we'll say five years, so that's just another key part of the, of the, of the system is that we just look at um, the last five years for the data available. So there's no fixed baseline, nor across indicators is there a fixed baseline within a report. They're gonna be all, all be different. So it's just the last five years. Um, so um, basically, you know, um, it's, it's difficult to look at a longer term sort of um, comparison, but we have attempted something at which we'll also talk about a bit later. Um, as I say, so right, so basically looking at the um, life expectancy um, sort of itself, male life expectancy has improved across 
the most and least deprived areas over the five years. But um, but they've sort of improved at the same rate, and the gap has remained at seven years. So that means um, a male living in the least deprived areas could expect, on average, to live seven years longer than their counterpart in the least deprived areas. The corresponding gap for females is 4.8 years. Um, in terms of healthy life expectancy, um, you can see here females in the least deprived areas can expect to live in good health for more than 15 years than those in the most deprived areas. That's quite a stark difference. Um, when we look at males, that's 12.5, so that's still quite a big difference as well. So, sorry, there's going to be sort of quick whistle stop going through these, but then the next, the next chapter we'll look at is premature mortality. Um, what's included in this section would be um, 20 years of life lost, um, various mortality sort of um, sort of rates such as treatable, preventable, or avoidable mortality, and also premature mortality due to secondary disease, respiratory disease, or cancer. Um, um, sorry, sorry, Bill, can I just come in there? We're, we're only seeing, or I'm only seeing your cover screen. We're not seeing the slides individually, and I don't think they're, they're to, on my screen anyway, they're not fully readable. So I'm just wondering, can you change that? Can you bring up each slide individually as you're going through it there? Well, I, I've got the slide up here on, on my screen. So I'm not sure what's okay. Uh, um, can I just check with Clark? Clark, are you seeing yes. the uh, the cover screen? Or are you seeing each individual? No, it, it's just the the cover one. So you've probably put the slideshow on, but we're not seeing the slideshow. We're still seeing that initial PowerPoint uh, right. page. So we are. Okay. So, is there any advice on how to fix that? Um, I think if you come out of the slideshow and just click on each of the slides as you go down, so it is. Then we can see the the slides um, that way. Okay. Yeah, so we're now we're now seeing key findings, hospital activity. So so we're seeing that slide now on our screen. Okay, right, I think I was on this screen. Um, okay, premature mortality. Yeah, um, yeah. So so apologies for that. I, I, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'll just go through the individually. Right. Okay. Um, so um, so basically, uh, in this section, uh, I sort of outlined the the, the various different. Um, indicators in the section. Um, the, uh, there's been improvements across you know, um, all areas for most of the indicators, um, sort of most deprived, least deprived in the Northern Ireland area. So it's, it's, um, there's been improvements, but um, which has meant there's been no real change for many of the indicators apart from preventable mortality, where the gap widened slightly, and treatable mortality, where it narrowed. And the largest gap within this section would be the respiratory mortality amongst under 75s, where um, the rate in the most deprived areas was three and a half times that seen in the least deprived. So we move on to the next chapter with the uh, major diseases and what's involved in this um, is basically circulatory admissions, respiratory admissions, cancer admissions, and also um, prescription rates for statins and antihypertensive. Um, so in this, apart from statins, which are where the, where the gap widened, um, they've generally remained similar or narrowed slightly. Um, and to see the biggest gap in this section is respiratory emission rate, which um, in the most deprived areas was double that in the least deprived. Okay. Um, the next chapter, which is on page 22-23, of your report is hospital activity, and this is cover all various different hospital admission rates. Um, and we can see here that they've remained fairly constant over the period, with the exception of all the missions emergence, and emergency emissions, which both narrowed. But even the emergency emissions itself, when you say it narrowed, it's sort of it still remained 60% higher in the most deprived areas. Mental health, again, page 24 of the report. This, this um, houses self-harm admissions, uh, prescriptions for mood and anxiety disorders, and also deaths due to self or due to intentional self harm. We've had to remove the suicide sort of um, indicator because um, at the minute the, the, there's a review by the coroner looking at deaths of undetermined intent because um, there's been big differences in Northern Ireland um, compared with the rest of um, the UK, and so they're still looking into that. So the best thing for us is just to use the, um, this this indicator. Um, so we've revised the series going back. So um, within this this chapter, self harm admissions improved across all areas and narrowed, um, and the gap narrowed. But um, the opposite was true for um, prescription rate for mood anxiety disorders. 
um, which basically worsened in every area and 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 the gap widened. So um, not particularly good news on that. Okay, so we'll move on to the next section, which is alcohol, smoking and drugs. Um, so over the last while, the sort of um, the indicators within this section have, always, have tended to be the biggest, uh, show the biggest um, inequality gaps in Northern Ireland. And this is continued in this report. Um, so we look at sort of, you know, um, drug related and drug use deaths, you know, the gap widened. Um, but for the other indicators in the groups of alcohol deaths and admissions, um, the gaps actually narrowed or remained similar. But even that, the, if we look at alcohol specific mortality and alcohol related and hospital admissions, um, it was still four times, the, the mission rate in the most deprived areas was still four times that seen in the least deprived areas. Okay. Um, and so we've come to the end of the chapters here. So um, pregnancy and early years, now there's a number of different indicators included under this section. We have um, infant mortality, smoking during pregnancy, breastfeeding on discharge from hospital, Various birth weight indicators, including small for gestational age and the teenage birth rate. So, we're looking at all those indicators, only um, the breastfeeding on discharge from hospital showed a narrowing within the inequality gap. Um, and the biggest gap within this section would be smoking during pregnancy, where um, the percentage of those who smoke during the pregnancy in most of the most deprived areas was five times that in the least deprived areas. And the final chapter look, is, is childhood obesity. So um, there's been no notable changes in the proportion of primary ones who are obese or overweight, but um, within the most deprived areas that's continued over the last wee while to show that those, um, those children in the most deprived areas have higher obesity rates and this was two thirds higher in the, in the last year we looked, that we looked at. Okay, so now I'm just, that's sort of, of course, I whistle stop and I apologize. It's been so quick, you know, going through, but time is limited, as you'd appreciate. Um, so the next couple of slides basically show um, a sort of an overview of, um, you know, gaps that widen and gaps that, you know, um, narrowed over the, over the period. And then within this table, you can see um, the green means that the health outcome within that area improved. Amber, it's stayed the same red, obviously then worsened. So. For these things, so just for an example, I'm not going to say all of them, but potential years of life loss improved across all areas, but the improvements in the least deprived areas was, it was at a faster rate than in the most deprived areas, so the gap widened. Conversely, if we looked at um, the standardized death rate for drug-related causes, was it worsened across all areas? Um, it basically, the worsening was at a faster rate in the most deprived areas, hence the gap was widened. So. Conversely, if we look at those gaps in there, then there's perhaps good news that there's, there's in, in sheer number, there's more that narrowed than, than those that widened. Um, and again, with the similar thing, so if we looked at um, the in cancer incidence, which is um, um, deteriorated in Northern Ireland and the most deprived areas and least deprived areas, um, you know, the gap actually narrowed because the you know, the, the decline wasn't as fast in the most deprived areas as it was in the least deprived areas. So that's just a, a handy wee table just to sort of you know, give you an overview of what's happening across you know, these, these indicators. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that we used a five-year gap um, or a five-year time series to look um, at inequality caps. And so we've attempted, and we hadn't much time to do this, to sort of the widen out. Now, there's, there's difficulties in doing this because of, um, you know, changes in definition over time, you know, sort of, um, you know, consistency in the data sources, definitions, etc. Um, so we've managed to go back nine years, but we'll maybe look at this and see if we can go back further with other indicators and, and make these, make those findings available if people think they're useful. So if we look at the, the life expectancy family first, because this is done in years. Um, so the key to understanding this chart is that sort of um, the, the blue area uh, the blue bordered area basically sort of if that extends outside the orange area to the to the um, outside of the chart then that means the gap is widened 
So as we can see here for disability free life expectancy and healthy life expectancy indicators for both males and females, the gap widens, whilst the life expectancy indicators, the lines pretty much match. So that would indicate there's been no change in the gap over nine years. Um, if we look then at the other, some of the other sort of um, indicators that we that are included in the system, um, we can see here that sort of um, teenage birth rates is widened, um, drug related causes, um, and the death rate for drug related causes and the death rate for drug misuse, and also smoking during pregnancy have all widened over the period, whilst um, hospital admissions for alcohol related causes or the death rate for alcohol specific causes um, have actually narrowed. Okay, and finally, I mean, I mean and, and I apologies for the speed I've gone through this, but you know, I know it's it's you know, quite a lot of information in a very short time. Um, just because I've been concentrating on regional inequalities, um, a quick overview of what's happening at the sub-regional level, and these are the five, so the five biggest gaps for each half of social care trust, and we can see a number of the number of the indicators are sort of um, sort of repeated, so drug and alcohol. Um, teenage births, self harm, they're all sort of repeated right across all the trusts. And, we, and when we look at um, the local government districts as well, it's a similar picture. You're getting the same kind of indicators coming through as, as the large gaps. And that's, that's basically all I wanted to sort of to share with you today, sort of. Um, but um, so hopefully that's been informative. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And um, going back then to. Um, Gary, are you Gary? Do you have any other opening remarks, or do you want us to go into Q and A? Whatever you want, Chair. I could, I could set out briefly some of the policy response, or if you want to maximise time for questions, happy to go straight into Q and A. Whatever, whatever suits you and your time is best. Yeah, well, I think we will get to Q and A, and and probably a lot of the policy response will come up at, in 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 that sense. So that that would be maybe useful. Okay. So thank you, thank you for that, and I suppose. Um, uh, well, firstly, I do want to acknowledge that there have been improvements and, and narrowing of inequalities in some areas. But I have to say, on, on an overall reading, there are some hugely worrying figures, and we're very conscious that we don't see the full picture in relation to the further impact that the pandemic has had um, in relation to inequalities. The data is, is key and is vital. There's absolutely no question about that, and it's very impressive in, in many ways, the level of data. However, I suppose my concern would be that the data is only as useful as the response with it, which it informs. And the part of the picture that, that I'd be very keen to discuss and would like to see developing is we know what the problems are as a result of this huge uh, exercise in collating the data. It's very clearly set out. It's very specific in relation to certain areas that are causing concern, uh, not only geographically, but areas of healthcare. And I suppose, you know, some of, the, some of the things do cause considerable concern, and I'll just pick a couple of them out uh, from, from the key findings. Between 2013-15 and 2017-19, there was no change in male or female healthy life expectancy and in its most relief to areas, including no notable change in the deprivation gap. Another section highlights that... Uh, for indicators of premature mortality, rates generally decreased. However, large inequality gaps continue to persist, with the rate of respiratory mortality among under 75s in the most deprived areas three and a half times that in the least deprived. Uh, another area that's highlighted is the inequality gap for crude death rate for intentional self-harm narrowed, uh, but the rate continues to be approximately double that in the least deprived areas. And the final one I want to just flag up is that for male life expectancy, the inequality gap between the 20% most deprived areas and the area average widened in the northern, southeastern, and western trusts. Um, and uh, some of the other trusts had, a, had an iron. But those add up to significant, significant issues. So just to take for an example, um, the issue of under 75s in the most deprived area, um, that, that those gaps continue to persist. So what are the department doing to address that inequality and to what, what are the targets in terms of how how we're going to reduce it and what are the strategies and policy that and budgeting indeed if that's if that's relevant to underpin that area of work 
Thanks, Chair, and, and that's a really helpful overview of the, of the challenges I think we face around around inequalities. And um, maybe if I just set out the, the general kind of um, response to inequalities and how we lead, and then we can maybe touch on some of the specifics. So um, I'm not policy lead for all those specific areas, so there may be questions we, we come back to in due course. But um, I think the statistics, and it is really impressive what Bill set out, do set out the challenge that we face around health inequalities. And we have a really good monitoring system, which is a really good basis to start from, um, much better than some of our other, other jurisdictions. Um, so, um, and I think what I would point out at the start is, um, there is our, our, our health inequalities are, are substantially an outcome of the social and economic inequalities that exist in Northern Ireland uh, that feed through the process. And, and Bill has rightly focused on the, the differential between the, the best, the least deprived and the, and the most deprived. But it is also important to note that you know, inequalities exist in a social gradient. So every point of deprivation below the least deprived, we all are affected by health inequalities. And we need to reflect that, that we, you know, we can't just focus on the, the most and the least deprived. We need to look right across the social gradient at addressing those issues. Uh, health inequalities are, are really uh, the result of a, a number of different dimensions. So we have socioeconomics and deprivation. We have inequality, uh, sorry, equality and diversity, such as our Section 75 groups, geographical differences. So we've urban and rural differences. And we also have vulnerable and at-risk groups, such as those suffering homelessness who really have cliff age inequalities that they face. Uh, and challenging is that all those dimensions can overlap, increasing the risk of, of poor health outcomes. So health inequalities are, are both complex and complicated. Um, the, the overarching. Gary, Gary, I'm sorry, sorry for cutting across you. I do, and I do, I do understand that overall context. And I have to say, I did a very interesting meeting last week with the Community Development Network, and I, I understand that there's all these socioeconomic stuff. However, I suppose in terms of time today, I want to, I want to zero in on specifics and specific responses to, to, um, rather than more high, high level general issues. So just, just, just like, is there, is there a plan within the department? to address that issue of under 75s respiratory. And again, I'm very conscious that respiratory is a particular uh, outcome and, and difficulty in terms of COVID. Um, so that's likely to be worse. I do sit on the all party group on, on respiratory health, but is there a plan within the department to deal with that, to address that inequality? So, so the, I don't lead on, on respiratory health policy, Chair, so I, I can't give an overview of, of exactly what's being taken forward in, in that area. Um, there are underpinning bits that sit within my directorate that look at that, so issues around smoking, uh, around working around air quality, and, and all those will pick up inequalities and focus on them. I suppose what I lead on is making life better, which is the overarching framework um, for improving health and, and addressing inequalities, and that looks at those strategic issues and looks at working with other departments departments uh, and sets the framework to look at those areas within the department. But you'll appreciate there's nuances across all those different policy areas. So, for example, um, if you look at, you know, the inequalities in smoking and the inequalities in alcohol, um, actually, and Bill can keep me right on the stats, but it, it basically it shows, for example, that um, more people, uh, more affluent people tend to drink more alcohol. But actually, it's the most deprived who come to the most harm. So when we're developing a new strategy in that, we need to focus on what reduces the harm. Uh, whereas if you look at smoking, actually prevalence is the difference. So, you know, uh, prevalence is higher in the least deprived communities for tobacco use rather than, uh, sorry, the most deprived communities rather than the least deprived communities. So in that area, you focus on reducing prevalence. So addressing the inequality is actually specific to the policy area. Uh, and therefore, that would be really important to get to the detail of, you know, looking at the, the framework for respiratory health that was developed a number of years ago and, and what's being done and updated on that now. I, I don't have that detail for that specific one. I tend to cover the more public health um, led ones, alcohol and drugs, th th those type of areas. Um, in, 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 more, in, more, in more general terms then, Gary, like, do the department come to yourselves when they're allocating budgets out? Do they interact with yourselves to say, okay, here's the figure that we know from your work that this inequality exists. What is it we need to do in terms of resources, in terms of targeting budgets, uh, and in terms of measuring outcomes and improvement? Do they engage with you in that, in that type of level of detail across the various 
programs. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's work across the department to look at those issues and engage across different bits. Looking at the statistics that Bill and Kaylin lead on to try and drive drive that improvement. We obviously can provide advice from a public health point of view as to where those um, different areas are and what might be required in those. The public health agency would play a key role in, in service development. Um, so if you're looking at respiratory services, the public health agency will provide advice to the health and social care board and to um, trusts around what is required to improve those services, what is required to address the inequality, and that would lead into commissioning plans, uh, which are co-agreed, as you will know, with the board and the PHA in terms of addressing those issues. So th those are really important in terms of bringing professional public health advice into addressing specific areas, uh, and, and certainly you know, those, those are led on and looked at. Um, what I would also say is there's new work, uh, and I know my colleagues in the department updated you on the work to close the board, uh, and the, the, then the, the, the work around integrated care systems and um, the new, uh, new planning models that are required in that. And we've been working really closely with those colleagues to make sure that um, public health approaches to addressing uh, health issues are embedded within that approach. Uh, uh, and that we bring our learning and, and aligning our making life better indicators with those as well, so that actually we can demonstrate through from program to government through making life better and, in, and into the new um, outcomes model that will be developed to support that, that actually population health and public health and inequalities are, are central to that process. So really reassuring that inequalities and population health have been built in at that level to you know that new planning model going forward, and I think that's a real opportunity for us all. Yeah, and I and I know and I know that that I'm sure you'd agree with me that it is no longer um, enough to pay lip service to health inequalities because if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's that we can can no longer leave communities vulnerable. So what actual what actual work on in terms of cross departmental work is being done at this point in time? So there's a range of across the departmental work happening across a number of areas under Programme for Government and under Making Life Better, um, looking at different areas. And, and I think it is important to reflect, you know, research shows that actually only 20% of health outcomes are driven by clinical care. Actually, 40% are driven by the socioeconomic um, areas in which people live, and 10% are driven by the physical environment. So there's 50% there's of your health outcomes driven by where you live and the environment that you live in. Um, the other 30% are a result of health behaviours, which are also a result of that. So under Making Life Better, we, we have a, a range of structures that meet across departments to look at areas around anti-poverty, around uh, child uh, child poverty, around uh, housing and homelessness, educational attainment, social exclusion, loneliness, uh, and a lot of work on, on areas like suicide prevention, where we've discussed lots of different approaches, you know, physical methods of, of um, suicide can, can, prevention. Yeah. Can, can you give me an example of an actual program that's, that's targeting any of those areas rather than, I, I get the sense of discussion. I know there's a large, a lot of understanding and a lot of the figures are known, but can you give me an example of a program that's targeting uh, an inequality or a, a geographical area? Yeah, so we, we tried um, under Transformation Money a, a new Healthy Places program in three areas across Northern Ireland um, in 2019, um, which brought together a number of government departments um, specifically to look at three um, different geographical areas. So Listen Ski, uh, the Glens area of uh, sort of uh, the Northern Trust. Um, and uh, Ballycell and Maradoyne, uh, and we uh, managed to align some uh, budgets across those areas to go in and work with local communities to identify the, the issues that they wanted to address. So it's really important that we work with local government, but actually local communities, um, uh, and each of those areas delivered different programs uh, and bringing in different area, uh, equivalents to do it uh, based on what they were. So um, in, in the Glens area, for example, we undertook a, a, a participatory budgeting program where we actually allowed the local community to vote on different elements that they wanted to progress and support uh, in that community, uh, bringing them together and addressing issues actually around good relations, around um, integration of communities, around um, physical activity uh, uh, and support, and, and using different sites. Uh, and those have those have evaluated um, pretty well. We're still finalising those because some of them were delayed. Unfortunately, it, it ran into 2020 and ran into to COVID, so some of that was was pushed back um, due, due to some of that. But that, that was a very specific program where we worked collectively across departments in those areas um, to and, address. And, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to cut across again, but I'm very conscious of time. Do you have any outcomes in terms of demonstrable uh, demonstrable improvements? 
Well, we, we do we do have as they evaluation that should they evaluated well in those areas. You'll appreciate health inequalities as a large tanker to turn around. Um, yeah. You know, a, a, a program. So, that so when you for, say evaluated well, what do you mean? I, I mean the communities uh, engaged well with it. They thought it uh, addressed the issues that they wanted to address. They felt uh, it, what, it worked it, with them. Did the, did the health statistics demonstrate improvement in health inequalities? We, you're not going to see changes in health inequality statistics like that in the course of a year. You know, as Bill said, even the monitoring they do tends to you know roll statistics over a number of courses of years. So you're looking for proxy indicators of engaging people and community development and and other different uh, resources in the short term um, around bringing those forward. But we're going to we're going to return to that and we're going to use the learning from that to, to build into a community development program that the public health agencies working with other um, departments on uh, in particular. Uh, around supporting communities to address issues like COVID. So all the learning builds up. But as I say, you know, unfortunately, you're not going to see changes in, in inequality indicators in a year. And in fact, they're probably going to go the other way, Chair, as you say, with COVID. Um, there are indications in England already that life expectancy has fallen in 2020. We don't we don't have those stats for here yet. Um, and yeah, the but, inequality but, but was greater. Yeah. But we can't simply accept that they're going to get worse. What we need to see and what I would like to see is that there will be programmes underpinning each of the areas dedicated programs, whether that's on a geographic basis, on a demographic basis, on a on a health condition basis or whatever. So I'm going I'm going to have to move on for now because I don't want to take up too much time, but it is it is a key area. One other thing I want to flag up before I move on to, to other members is around oral health inequalities. We see no reference to oral it's been removed from this report. I'm very, very concerned about that, I have to say. Um, the oral health strategy that we are operating under here at the present time dates back to 2007 and has never been formally reviewed. Um, the targets set out in the strategy extend to 2013 only and are based on data which was obtained in 2003. So that's significantly out of date. Across the North, generally, and in more depraved communities, large numbers of children on an ongoing basis are suffering needlessly from a largely preventable disease of tooth decay. And many are requiring hospitalization, general anesthetic, and extractions. In fact, it's the largest a, I believe, largest single cause of a hospital admission for children. So the figures are shocking, with more than 70% of under 15-year-olds with tooth decay. And across the north, dentists pulled 23,035 bad teeth from the mouths of 4,724 children under general anaesthetic in 2017-18. So... The truth is we're operating under a strategy which is totally outdated and increasingly irrelevant, and I have called on the department to develop a new oral health strategy. But can you explain why that has been removed from the health inequalities report and what is being done to address health oral inequalities? I may, I may be coming in on that one. Um, yeah. Basically, um, after we published the report, um, the British Dental Association came back and made similar points as, as you're making today. Um, it was it, it basically all we had you know over time was um, dental registrations um, um, because the data when we looked at it previously sort of um, wasn't of, of, of sufficient quality but the um, BSO have actually made great strides in their statistics and um, and since the reports come out we, um, Keenan and myself have both liaised with the BSO statisticians and we're, um, we're going to be introducing a number of new indicators sort of into, into this back into the system and um, so they'll be reported on in the next report. So hopefully that's helpful. Oh, that, that's an issue that we want, we, we want to keep an eye on. It's, it's a, and, and again, it's similar where there's no point in, there's no point in knowing if we can't see tangible evidence of what's being done about the inequalities, there's, there's little point in some ways of reporting them year on year. The reports must generate activity, action and outcomes and, and improvements. Okay, I'm going to go to members. So I'm going first of all to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. I then have Carol Nikhilin, Jerry Carroll, or Leah Flynn, and Paula Bradshaw. So I'll go back then to Pam. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thanks, Chair, and thank you um, to the officials in the panel today for your for your detailed presentation. Obviously, there's there are an awful lot of concerns um, entailed on that, and, and I'd appreciate if we could get a copy of that presentation sent through so that we study it further as well in our, in our own time. Um, but in terms of the um, the negative change in respect of the prescription um, of medication for mood and, and mood and anxiety, um, you know, um, which I suppose I want to ask 
really is are we looking at this is, is it a short-term trend or has this been going in in the direction of the gap widening for some time and i'm very aware that you've obviously highlighted that these are pre-pandemic figures so we would expect probably a much greater widening of that gap as well um which so that is of um considerable tell us um whether you you see a trend of that um that has come, been coming over a considerable period of time or whether that's something more short term and is it linked to higher levels of um, people presenting with mental illness thank you Well, are you happy to pick up the trend? Well, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to pick up the trend if you want. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, uh, well, basically, we're, when we're talking about the widening of this inequality gap, it's, it's quite a small change, really, over the last five years. Um, it do, there doesn't seem to be a long-term trend with the widening of that. It, it's, it remains fairly static. It's not a very volatile gap, to be honest, but it's always sat around 60% to 70%. Um, just in the last five years, as Bill mentioned earlier on, this is sort of like a rolling baseline. So every time he releases this report, we drop off a year, we add a year. So there is a you, next, next year. This could say what narrowing because your 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 base point will be 2016. But um, in short, there, there's very little change in the gap, to be honest. Um, and this is a prescription rate for drugs that are could be attributed to mood and anxiety disorders. Some of these drugs may be used for other causes as well. It's it, it's a health indicator rather than a direct assessment of of mental health as such. But it, it, it's we've these are the drugs that are being outlined to us by BDSO as sort of the best group to sort of gauge um, how many people are um, on drugs for things that could be used for mood and anxiety disorders. We did see a change. I don't have the evidence in front of me, but um, the uh, prescription costs can have a big effect. On this, so when um, prescriptions became free, we did see this change in behaviour there, um, and that's if me memory serves me, I think we've seen an increase there in the most deprived areas for um, prescriptions for mood and anxiety disorders. But I wouldn't have any further detail or evidence um, to suggest the reasons behind that. I hope that helps. And obviously, there will be a wee bit of noise around that as well, and that and high GPs treat mood and anxiety disorders you know whether they refer people for you know um you know you know, or, or, um they work um for well if they you know if they for counseling sorry and um uh, or or they basically um are, are just prescribing you know sort of drugs for right, right off whatever so we you know it, it you know there will be noise around this data, data. it's a proxy measure as Kevin says it's um we put it in because it's in mental health it's really difficult to get good measurements, you know, sort of, um, uh, which we can sort of monitor over time. So, um, again, uh, again, it's one to, to keep an eye on, but sort of, you know, to, but to appreciate that there might be, um, you know, sort of this sort of noise. And as Skin says, that, that the changes in the in the gap in sixty, it was sixty two percent in two thousand fifteen, and sixty six percent in two thousand nineteen. So it's it hasn't been a massive change, but it it has it does meet the statistical significant significant change. So we report as a widening. Okay, and when will we expect to see then um, uh, the new data to include the, obviously the, the the period of the pandemic? Because obviously there's going to be, um, there's, I expect there to be a huge knock on impact on, on all these types of figures. Um, although uh, I suppose GP access is still uh, a big problem as well because we know, whilst we know GPs are working very hard, we know there uh, there are more patients who are coming back repeatedly because they haven't received treatments that they've needed um, in terms of elective care, for example. Um, so there will be an awful impact there. But also, I think there's still a perception from many people that doctors are either closed or that um, they're just so difficult to get through to that people can give up. So what sort of um, impacts are you are you expecting on, on those figures um, when when you do get the updated figures for the pandemic and is that is that another year away or what sort of time frame would there be for that? 
Well, the problem, the problem with many, with, with um, well, it probably will be the guts of a year. We'll do our best, you know, obviously to to because we'll know there'll be um a lot of demand to see these as soon as possible. But um, one of the things that we're sort of um sort of sort of sort of held back by is that sort of um you appreciate reading the report. There's not a lot of um use of mortality data. And um, and we get that from um, NISRA, um, NISRA Core, and essentially we are restricted until they publish the Registrar General report that in, in in publishing anything. But we'll make every every effort to try and get it out as as soon as possible. But you're probably looking towards the end of the year at the earliest. Um, if there were a demand to look at specific things like um, you know um, the, the the prescriptions, as you say, so you know. Um, we could talk to BSO and uh, and we could put out, um, you know, we, we don't really like to put out statistics before they all go out, you know, so it's, it's you know, picking and choosing, but um, if there's a demand that we can, we can, we can, we can sort of put out specific sort of, you know, sort of analyses. And so we could look at that once the, once the sort of the, um, the updated information is available from BSO. I'm not sure what date that is, Caitlin, maybe you, you have an idea when we get that data? Yeah, I think we normally get that data around November time. Um, and uh, just come back to your question about what we would expect. Well, we're not going to really try and guess what way that's going to go, but you can see the numbers with prescription rates for mood and anxiety are 200, and the latest figure was 219 per, per 100 or per 1,000 population. So that's that's huge. That's a huge amount of our population that are on are on prescriptions for mood and anxiety disorders. So with, with those sort of large numbers, you don't tend to see as much volatility with them. They're not going to drop massively within a year or increase massively. You wouldn't expect to under normal conditions. Um, so, but in terms of the, the impact of COVID, that's, you, you made a good point there. Um, would, that, would that decrease as people either can't get access to services or feel they can't get access to services or will it increase um, dramatically as a result of um, the mental health impact of COVID. But we will, with this indicator, because it's a single year indicator, we don't need to group this with other years. So it will be one we'll be able to look at fairly directly and that will be able to assess 2020 on its own compared to previous years. So it, there won't be as much noise around it and caveats to it. No, we should be able to get a real strong picture of, of the impact that the last year has had on on that particular indicator. And, and there are other measures you can look at, obviously, as well, you know, sort of um, um, where Keen and I work, we also house the, um, the health survey, Northern Ireland, the annual health, health survey, um, which has GSQ12, and that should be available around October, November time, you know, so, um, so, and we can see how that has, has changed, you know, sort of, um, and that would give it, um, that gives an indication of potential mental health problems. And I think it's also being included in the, um, the COVID attitude survey being run by NISRA. Um, so, you know, so you'll make an early indications of that from, from there and, and see, you know, and I think um, early indications are that it's, it has increased substantially, sort of the, um, sort of the mental health issues. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pam. Um, and I'm going then to Carol. And if we could just ask all members of the committee and also the panel just to be as as uh, brief as possible, should we get as many questions in, in in this area that I think is of such interest. And also, if I could ask the panel if one of you can give sort of the the uh, the answer, the substantive answer. If there's anything to be added to, by all means. But um, if if you can identify which of you are best placed to answer. The, the members' questions. So we'll go to Carol Nicole and go ahead, Carol, please. So um, thank you for the presentation. And I have to say it was har it's harrowing reading. And unfortunately, you know, I, I represent North Belfast, was what, which is one of the most deprived constituencies. So someone living in BT 13, 14, 15, um, really is going to live, if you're a fella, you're going to live seven years less than someone who lives in the more affluent part of those and I have seen no evidence of a policy or indeed um, investment or a real challenge by a department to tackle that. So it's that comment. And the other comment would be, Gary, in your sum up about our down in Ballysill and um, the, the community project, and you mentioned good relations. It's just to say equality. Good relations is desirable. Equality is essential. So 
we are talking about health inequalities. I just want to say that it should be about better outcomes. So I haven't seen or heard any policy um, policy plans or delivery that's actually going to tackle systemic health inequalities for people living in the most deprived areas, if anything. I mean, the church outlined oral health. You've got more obesity, more heart disease, um, certainly more uh, uh, addictions or uh, dependency on prescribed medication. I've no doubt Orlea Flynn will raise the whole issue of suicide, self-harm and addiction. So can you point to one specific or several or even a couple programs that actually genuinely tackle health inequalities in the most deprived communities? That's my first question. I think I'll come back on that one because it's more for me than the stats. And uh, what I would say is, um, you know, if if we look at the public health agency spend and 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 where they invest their money, it is it is primarily focused on areas of, of deprivation in deprived communities. And I suppose just some examples uh, um, that they've given me in terms of um, the, the COVID response and, and looking to try and maintain. Uh, and enable people in the most deprived areas to improve their health and well-being. So, uh, obviously, the, the stress awareness courses they ran out had over 100,000 people in them. They uh, invested an additional £1 million pounds in small grants uh, to help people improve their emotional health and well-being. Um, 600 families uh, in the most deprived communities were, were able to access the additional early intervention support service. Um, the, over 1,000 homeless people rece receiving uh, getting started boxes. Um, to support them in, in that. They've also moved an awful lot of their um, health improvement uh, initiatives to, to online delivery um, across sexual health, smoking cessation, physical activity, breastfeeding, emotional health and wellbeing, et cetera. Now, I, 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 and that, that, that's positive because it kept those um, services being accessible. There are concerns, and you'll appreciate this, about digital um, equalities that exist yeah. if we move, okay. move online. Um, so so we, need, we need to just bear that in mind as well. Um, but, but they have now developed a short, medium and long term recovery plan for all those health improvement services. And the majority of that is focused on areas of deprivation. Um, so they, they are focusing you know, and bending the spend um, as their, their you know, sort of 80 million odd program budget uh, into addressing in those areas. It is a huge challenge and we need support from other departments uh, and other agencies and local communities and local government as well. But um, the PHA, you know, I'm certainly would be happy to come and, and give a bit more briefing on, on the detail of their actual spend and, and what they're doing around okay. that. Okay, so thanks, Zach, Gary, and, and that will be something that I'll, we'll, we'll discuss at the end because I'm not convinced that um, I don't think it's enough. I think it's just tinkering around the edges, to be frank, rather than dealing with the core problem. The other question I have, Chair, is BSO were mentioned quite a few times. So, I, as you know, the Health and Social Care Board is being dissolved and it'll go to the Department of Health. So, um, really, how can local commissioning be targeted to address those in most need? And then the second and la sorry, third and last question is, in relation to heart disease and, and other inequalities that are like generally systemic, even by your own statistics, given the waiting lists, and the waiting lists are quite bad, uh, particularly for people who've got those conditions, what policy and initiatives are the department bringing forward to not only look at commissioning at the point of need for to reduce inequalities, but also the inequalities that have crept in to the waiting lists um, as a result of not just COVID, pre-COVID, COVID, COVID and post-COVID. What, uh, what policy and funding initiatives are going to reduce those current inequalities, please? So, yeah, I, I, Carl, very helpful questions. And, and in terms of the closure of the board, um, as, as I say, uh, you know, with local commissioning groups ending, uh, what the department is doing is developing a, an integrated care system uh, approach or framework uh, and uh, supporting that with a, a new planning model for um, health and social care services. Uh, and they have embedded population health planning, uh, and we've been involved in that at the heart of that new approach. Uh, and there will be different levels to that uh, in terms of different groups. So obviously, you'll have the, the new group in the department that, that leads on that regionally as, as, as the 
health and social affairs closes, but then there'll be regional groups and local groups looking to influence that at the local level, very much engaging with local communities, local GPs, um, but also local uh, community planning as well, because there's an overlap between that. So um, really, it, it, it's a really good opportunity to embed population health planning um, at, at the local level within the delivery of services and, and make sure that health inequalities is at the heart of that. And I, I think colleagues have, have updated you before on that, but I'm sure they'll be you know, content to update you again in the future. Um, the, the issue around, around waiting lists, um, there are a range of different initiatives being brought forward, as you're aware, both in terms of recovery planning um, for health and social care services, um, but also, uh, you know, future planning for those services, uh, initiatives like No More Silos, looking at, you know, really addressing those waiting lists by clinical need uh, on the basis of, of what, what's put in front of them and, and the additional funding required to, to drive that through. But obviously, the budget position is very challenging on, on that. And, uh, you know, we will certainly drive forward as much uh, movement on, on waiting lists as possible. But you are right. You know, while, while we look outside and the inequalities are, are, are driven primarily by social and economic inequalities, the health service itself needs to get better at um, segmenting and addressing that and targeting uh, access and availability to, to all communities to make sure that those inequalities don't come in through a different uh, area and hopefully the plans around that are, are in place. And Chair, can it just get some, when we're doing the feedback, could we just find out what the department are doing, particularly around that seven year gap for men in the least deprived areas to the most deprived areas? Because we just can't accept, I'm not saying you are, we can't accept that it's inevitable that people who are living and you know, who experience poverty and deprivation are going to die sooner, going to be more unhealthy, and their children are going to have less teeth. Like, frankly, we need to have a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you, Carol. Um, going then to Jerry, Carol. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, a lot of worrying, obviously, figures in that. Uh, and just a couple of quick points and then a, a few sort of uh, quick fire questions. Um, I mean, it obviously shows that we're, we aren't all in together and never were. Um, and I think, to be frank and blunt, the big elephant in the room here is the economic decisions that have been made by the current and previous uh, executives. Health isn't over here, and the economy and uh, economic questions aren't over here. They're very much connected. Uh, and I think there should be an absolute abysmal failure to tackle uh, inequality and deprivation. And actually, decisions made by current and previous executives have increased child poverty has shot up, more and more people going to food banks, which obviously leads to health inequalities either getting worse uh, or not changing at all. So that's the big elephant in the room for me, and that's something that um, I appreciate isn't the responsibility of the officials here, but something that has to be factored uh, front and centre into this conversation. And I think the key point is, um, I mean, poverty is a killer, um, and those figures I mentioned about men dying seven years younger than men in more affluent areas uh, really uh, suggest to me quite strongly that poverty is an absolute um, killer and killing people uh, at, a, at a younger rate, at a quicker rate, sorry. Um, just uh, um, a question following that. I mean, what role do, do the um, does the officials here play, if any, in terms of engaging with the uh, economy minister or department uh, or the finance minister or, or his department, because obviously this would be connected to budgets um, and, and they would have to, if we want to really address these inequalities, then there would have to be a focus on, on budgets in terms of what's been allocated, in terms of what's being prioritised. Um, so really just um, maybe to Gary or, or to whomever, um, what role of any is played uh, by engaging um, uh, with the economy and finance uh, departments, officials, uh, to try and tackle some of these questions. Thanks, Chair. It's a really, really helpful question and, and point. And I think you're, you know, you're right. We we often make the case that your health is your wealth in terms of, you know, the links between the various sectors. And it's exactly the sort of work that we, we lead on uh, in my branch, looking looking outwards, I suppose, to the other departments about where they can contribute to. Um, you know, creating a, a better well-being and better health and better economic health across departments and, and the interrelationship between those two. So we do engage um, with our all, our all our all our ministerial colleagues. There is a ministerial subcommittee on public health who actually meet to to look at these issues and, and address them and bring forward and drive forward specific areas uh, where we can. And obviously, we make the case as part of 
all budget settlements um, around, you know, addressing these issues. I think we, we also keen that, you know, funding is driven to addressing those big systemic issues as well as the health service. You know, we, we need to look at addressing poverty and we need to look at addressing um, educational attainment because that is what will drive the changes to health inequalities in the, in the longer term. Um, we, we can obviously play our part in health service and we're not downplaying our role in, in delivering those. We absolutely must and, and have to do that. But we need a collective approach across all departments and, and we certainly have been working through making life better to build that case. And in a way, it was almost a program for government before we had a program for government because it touched on all areas of all our departments. We need to review making life better in light of the new program for government and light of COVID because we need to focus on resilience, I think, in the long term, not just COVID recovery, but actually how do we make our communities more resilient um, with health and otherwise into the future. So we, we, we've unfortunately had to pause that work due to, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic pressures on the department, but we're really keen to kick that off again soon and, and be more specific about what we plan to do across departments to address some of those issues. So hopefully it reassures you, Jerry, that we, we do work, you know, across other departments uh, and certainly feed into budget processes and other things on these specific issues and, and the real need to bend the spend, you know, within health and other areas to, to address the health inequalities that exist because we need to get much better at targeting the, the action that we do. Yeah, yeah thanks, Fred. And uh, just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, my, my concern is these figures are bad as they are, uh, as, they, as they are in front of us at the minute, but we have a standstill budget uh, to quote the Finance Minister, uh, and it would indicate that these figures are probably going to uh, get worse um, in, the, uh, in the in the near future. Uh, just two quick questions. Um, the areas of Belfast and Derry, uh, Derry and Strabane, uh, have 32 and 25 areas, respectively, uh, that are worse than the average across the north, uh, but also uh, Lisburn and Castle Ray have no areas that are worse than the average. So uh, can we get an explanation as to why, uh, why that is? Because obviously there's... There's poor people in, in Lisburn and, and Castlereagh, obviously, um, but obviously there's, I would imagine, maybe a higher concentration of people with more uh, wealth and income. Um, and also, I mean, it's quite, quite concerning to see that the uh, 45% uh, of figures uh, that uh, indicate almost half of um, uh, preventable deaths in the north uh, were attributable to deprivation. So that's, that's just an astounding uh, figure. And, and just finally, the ambulance times obviously have increased. So people who have, you know, more likely to have respiratory illnesses and other illnesses are waiting longer uh, for an ambulance to uh, arrive at their doorstep. So what's the the um, the work being done to to challenge that to highlight those uh, problems as well? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Just, just very quickly, I suppose, um, there was a piece of work done looking at the multiple deprivation indicators and health is, is one of those, as you appreciate. And I think the overlap between um, health and the multiple deprivation indicators is, is really high. It's about 80%, whereas some of the other deprivation indicators are slightly broader. So it's that combination of, of deprivation and uh, in areas that really seem to drive poor outcomes. Um, you know, and it, it does tend to cluster. And I think you are right. There are bits of you get pockets of deprivation that can can hide, um, you know, poor outcomes in them because there is more affluence or more or, or some least deprived people in there, and that's why the social gradient is really important to consider when we're talking about health inequalities. It is the least deprived and the most deprived, but we need to recognise there are some people who suffer in those areas where there may there was people in South Belfast, even though you know it may be seen as some more affluent areas that that suffer from deprivation and poor outcomes. So we we we, we absolutely recognise that. Um, maybe we could come back on the, the you know, the, the NIAS figures, if that would be helpful. Um, I wouldn't have that to hand just now, but if, if we put that question down, happy to, happy to get an answer for that one. Okay, thank, thank you, Jerry. And going then to Orlea Flynn. Go ahead, Orlea, please. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Maybe just to quickly go back on a point that, that Jerry made there, and, and each right, there is an elephant in the room, and... We know that the department um, is obviously constrained as to how much investment um, they can put in to tackling health inequalities. Um, but you know, we know that there has been historic underinvestment and neglect for many, many years before the executive was in place. And just last week, the Department of Health officials, when we were doing a briefing around the budget, were also saying that there is a frustration there, um, even around this current budget that's in place. Um, and I think that that's in fact shared by all ministers, including the finance minister, um, who's obviously having to work what, with what he's been given from the British government. So it's just to make that point. Also to go back quickly on a point that um, the issue that Pam raised around that breakdown of the number of antidepressants 
So I know that two of the panel did mention that, so this isn't a massive change um, and that it's actually a small change over the last five years. Um, but I mean, the to be honest, it's completely depressing reading the document, looking at the stats. Not surprising, but depressing. Um, and in a recent answer to one of my assembly questions, I did ask the minister to give me a breakdown of the number of antidepressants that have been prescribed in each of the constituencies over the past three years. So the breakdown was for 2018, 2019 and 2020. And I mean, I'll just read you out just the statistics for Belfast alone. So the antidepressant prescription forms have increased in North Belfast by 30,000 from 2018. They've increased in West Belfast by 25,000 since 2018. They've increased in East Belfast by 15,000 and they've increased in South Belfast by 10,000. So again, you can see stark differences. But when I look down that list and I take your point, um, Gary, around trying to look at the data across a social gradient, and that is important when you look at the overall stats for Belfast. I mean, that's, that's people, individuals just from 2018 that are now on anti antidepressants that hadn't been previous to that. So I think that um, even the data, as you it's explained, it's a small change. To me, that's not a small change. That's a hell of a lot of people that are now on antidepressants that weren't a number of years ago. Um, but maybe just more broadly then, so around the, the alcohol and drug misuse, and I know that you had mentioned yourselves that that actually is the biggest health inequality gap here in the North. So it's the question is really what is being done around that. I know that there's the substance use consultation, which is great that that piece of work has been undertaken. Um, but my concern would be, given that um, we know that alcohol and drug misuse is costing the economy over £900 million a year, um, and that £250 million of that is, um, is fallen on the health service that's already stretched. Um, the, you're five times more likely to die of a drug death in a least deprived sorry, in the most deprived communities as opposed to the least deprived. You're four more times likely to die of an alcohol death, rated death. Um, the, the drug misuse deaths have trebled over the past 10 years. So what my fear is, oh, we're going to wait until the next 10 years and see that treble again. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, and Gary, I know you and I have met and spoke about the, um, the strategic direction for drugs and alcohol, the phase two at the time. Now that we'll have the consultation, um, can you give any detail around the cost, the funding and the timeline of when that work can actually be put in place to try and save people's lives? Because the briefing last week with the health officials, um, they couldn't give that commitment in the budget that this strategy will be funded. And just finally, the other big issue in relation to the alcohol um, issue and mortality rates, the minimum unit pricing. Um, can you just give us any update um, as to how the department can, can try and progress that important piece of work um, as well? Because I just don't think we can afford to wait for you know the next report that's coming out and to see the stats getting any worse because it is really depressing. I know it's not your fault, but I'm just putting those points to you. No, 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 good good points well made. And, and we're actually just hopefully in the process of finalising the new substance use strategy um, at, the, at the process. At the moment now, we brought back our co-production group because it's really important we, we develop this, you know, with everybody. Um, so they, they met over the last two Fridays uh, and we're now hoping to finalise that, get it to the minister and the executive. So I really hope in the next few weeks, actually, um, that we will be in a position to to issue that new strategy for for implementation and, and we're hoping uh, to align that as close as possible to the, the mental health strategy as well um, because the, because of the overlap between the two it's, it's not a complete one circle Venn diagram but there is a huge overlap uh, between the two issues so we hope to really show the alignment between those two um, obviously budgets are still being finalized and worked through we will certainly be making the case um, for you know additional funding to support the implementation of the strategy recurrently over a number of years because that's that's important that you know we have multi-year budgets to su to support that and align uh, with um, the mental health strategy on that as well. Um, uh, minimum unit pricing. Um, we uh, have been having discussions and we we'll hope later this year to to bring forward the the sort of consultation on the various options on minimum unit pricing. Um, uh, uh, which would then let us bring forward legislation that that consultation is the next key step um, in, in the process. We have good research going back. We have evidence from Scotland, 
Um, we've no evidence from Wales. Um, I think the consultation will be focused very much on uh, if we were to do this, how would we do this? Uh, and therefore inform legislation. And hopefully, you know, obviously there's not time to do that now within this mandate, unfortunately, with the other legislation going through. But um, if that was agreed and, and that's the way forward by ministers and the executive, we, we would hope to move quickly on that um, in the next executive based on obviously all the agreements required. Um, but we want to get in a good place to, to be able to move forward as quickly as we can once the agreed position is, is put forward. Um, hopefully that quickly answers the questions. But if you've any specific copy to pick them up. No, Gary, listen, I appreciate that. And as I said, I know I've spoke to you previously on these issues and the work that you've been you've been doing around it. Um, but it, it's just to labour that point in, in any of the discussions or work that you are doing as a team um, working alongside the minister and the executive. It's just to, I suppose, keep pushing that point, that the point that you made earlier, the biggest health inequality gap in the North at present is around that issue of drugs and alcohol. So we need to take action to do something about it. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arlea. And one then to Paula and I have Chara Hunter then. Um, that's who I have indicated in the presence. So go ahead, Paula Bradshaw, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your information this morning. Um, just to follow on from the Chair's point there around oral health, I appreciate there's the issues with young people not being registered in the tooth decay, but I, I at our all party group on cancer recently there we had a consultant in restorative dentistry and he was talking about the high percentage of men who are not um, presenting um, a dent, sorry, not registered with dentists, but are then presenting at later latter stages with um, mouth and throat cancer, and the best way to screen that is through dentistry. So I'm just wondering, is there any um, efforts then to actually try and bridge the gap then in older men? I suppose it's never too late to um, sign up for a dentist and, and um, get that all checked out. So that's the first question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think generally, um, and, and Bill can keep me right, that um, men, men's health outcomes tend to be worse uh, than women's across a range of, of areas. Uh, and that's a challenge for us. Uh, and it tends to be, I think, as you said, it, it tends to be late engagement, um, which means there's, there's problems then with the intensity of the response that's required, whereas we want to obviously engage earlier. Lots, there's lots of work underway um, through local community groups about trying to get and make men engaged more in their health and, and things like men's sheds. You know, work, PHA worked really closely with the development of those, those community groups that really engage with men and, and bringing in advice and uh, expertise to them. Um, I know the new cancer strategy is, is currently being um, finalised and I'm sure screening uh, and access to oral health will be a key part of that as they look forward. I know they're including prevention, uh, uh, diagnosis and, and screening as a part of that strategy. So there'll, there'll be more detail in that, uh, I know, in due course. But you're absolutely right. Anything we can all do, I think, to encourage uh, men of any age to engage with health services um, is really positive um, uh, and uh, really welcome um, a public message from us all. I know the PHA do a lot of work around it as well. Okay, thank you. I suppose uh, I think they, they suggested that it was up to 37% of, of men in deprived communities were not registered with a dentist, so there's a lot of work um, required. My, my second question is in relation to a presentation we received at the All Party Group on Lung Health, and that was um, from academics from Queen's who are doing a lot of research around um, pollution. I used to work in the village area, Donegal Road. Um, you know, so there, there are issues there because you've got the West Link and you've got that very congested Donegal Road itself in the city centre. So the question really is about how you are engaging with the academic research that's um, taken place to identify where there are high levels of emissions and then, as we know, the long-term impact on, on health. So yes, we, we engage with academics across a range of, of inequality indicators as well and, and uh, organisations like the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, looking at that on a north-south basis, but also Queen's and UU and others. Um, we do work closely with our colleagues in DERA on environmental health issues, pollution, um, because there are huge issues around that leading to health inequalities uh, and poor health outcomes. So we, we work to, I suppose, um, make people aware of the issues around, around pollution, but also to use things like health impact assessment of policies uh, to make sure that uh, the health of transport policies and um, you know developments is taken into account as those as those are moved forward and and, and people like um, uh, the environmental health officer in the past would have get involved in in those processes and and, and put health um, in, into that. Um, so we do work closely with that and recognise the impact of of air quality. Um, 
um, funny, one of the, the impacts of COVID at the start, there was, there was some indication that air quality may have improved at the very start, because obviously we had less uh, movement of cars, but I think over time that has certainly eroded. So we're probably probably back to where we are, but definitely we are keen to work with our colleagues about reducing, one, uh, the health services' own impact on pollution, uh, uh, but also uh, work to reduce that in all areas. So yes, definitely something we, we acknowledge and, and work with all our departments on. Thank you. And, and just a quick one to finish. Um, I appreciate the uh, indicators that you're using at the minute, but you know the, there's the increasing evidence of the impact on ACEs, adverse childhood experiences on long-term health. And I'm just wondering how frequently these are actually revised to, to make sure that there are the correct indicators that are being um, uh, measured, so to speak. Uh, obviously, some of them do overlap, but in many ways, I think that, that the, the evidence would show when you sort of drill down a wee bit, it's easier to actually identify how um, that will impact people in later life. Bill, do you want to pick up changes yeah. in measures? Um, basically, I, th I think we're sort of hostages to fortune, really, sort of, um, uh, in that we we actively seek out this information where, where it's available. Um, the the requirements to be an EHS CIMS indicator are that sort of thing we have robust small area data available, and that blows out an awful lot of data sources. Um, Kaylin and myself, you know, um, are constantly on, on, on the search for new and interesting um, sort of areas to put into, into the report. Um, you know, we've um, recently we, we've um, got access to NIMAT's data and we've done a review of that, looking at sort of, you know, um, you know whether there was further potential to look at sort of new indicators. Um, and that involves talking to nursing colleagues and sort of, um, and Gary as well, sort of, you know, and just to, to ensure that what we're, we're measuring is, is sort of meaningful. But um, unfortunately, so, you know, sort of, um, you know, it's not just as simple as basically lifting the survey here, doing this, and you know, it, it, it just wouldn't work. We can certainly look at inequality differences, you know, sort of for these surveys, you can do, you know, um, you can look at most deprived versus least deprived, whatever, but just in terms of this actual, this piece of work, this is this is a, this is a, uh, a ge geographical sort of you new know, um, statistical system, um, which incorporates inequalities. Um, so it may not lend itself sort of to, to actually be included. But um, if, if anybody knows of anything and they want to, you know, uh, and then push it in the direction of stuff, and you know, we'll definitely chase it up and, and, and add it if it's if it's relevant. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. And um, going then, the final indication that I have this morning so far, or this afternoon now as we are, is from Kira Hunter. Go ahead, Kira, please. Thank you, Chair. And I'm just mindful of the time, so I will try and be brief. Uh, thank you to the panel as well uh, for being here today. And I think members have raised a number of points um, that I'm really, really keen uh, to speak about around, uh, you know, suicide prevention. And I think reading through this, you know, it's just revealing of the systemic underfunding around these crucial services with, you know, dual diagnosis uh, and mental health services. And not a week goes by, I would imagine, uh, all of the members on this committee are aware um, that the mental health funding that's currently available is nowhere near enough and there's significant inequalities and it's it's frankly harrowing and both horrifying also. Uh, I suppose my questions have mostly been answered, but I, can I just ask for um, some clarification of what contributing factors or indicators are taken into account uh, when identifying and deciphering what is a, a, the most deprived area and least deprived area? Um, well, that's an exercise undertaken by NISRA, and um, there's there's seven domains used, and sort of and a variety of indicators under each domain, um, and they do a, a factor analysis of all put all these things together. So there's there's liaison with the departments involved, um, and again, it's 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 about availability of information at small geographical levels, robust information. So. Um, the um measure would have a certainly have a paper so on on how on how the multiple deprivation measure was brought together um as gary's alluded to you know previously there are the different health domains we use the multiple deprivation because health inequalities is you know is you know is is caused by such a myriad of different factors um you know um but you know so the health domain you know, we contribute to and it has you know, you know six or seven separate and these these will all be listed in a, a paper i just don't have at the hand but we can definitely share that and um and to say the actual that review is done sort of every um five to seven years um so we'll probably do one you know next year to, to review it and have a look at it and sort of um 
and as I say, but that, that sits with NISRA and sort of and as a collective of all the departments, all the statisticians right across who contribute to it. Okay, Bill, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just noted, um, you know, that uh, I think that Darien Straban District Council falls into my constituency. So noting that uh, it is 139% uh, increase above the local average um, for drug and alcohol misuse is very concerning. And I note that, you know, the Northland Centre based in Derry does a fantastic job, but the bed capacity really isn't reflective of this, of the need. Um, so just to note that that's very concerning. And lastly, I just have a question, uh, and other members have touched on this previously, about the detrimental impact COVID-19 um, will, will inevitably have, I suppose, uh, as we come out of this pandemic. I had recently spoken with a family um, who, uh, you know, they have a child and since they've gone into the pandemic, the child hasn't been socialised. Um, they're witnessing communication difficulties, um, you know, a lot of social anxiety from the child and also gaining access to speech and language therapists has been exceptionally difficult. Um, and I believe as we come out of COVID, we will see that further backlog. So I'm just curious uh, what, consider what considerations have been given on this and how do you feel uh, COVID-19 will shape health inequalities as we come out of it? Thanks, Carl. I'll maybe pick that one up. Um, I think uh, we, we have been trying our best to monitor um, information coming through on, on health uh, outcomes and health inequalities. It is, it is tricky because um, the timing is quite tricky to, to get some of that information, but we've been working particularly with the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, actually, um, to look at our making life better indicators and, and what, I, I suppose, what research is there that they might change and then what actual real world evidence is there that it might change. And we've been um, feeding that information into the executives' reviews of the restrictions as well, in line with all the COVID information and um, you know economy input and, and other sectors as well. So um, we have been trying the best to monitor those, those changes and outcomes. It, it, it's, it's a muddy picture, I would say, across it all. Uh, if you look at some, some of the health behaviours, generally you see kind of, for alcohol, for example, about a third of the population are drinking more, about a third of the population are drinking less, and about a third of the population are drinking the same. But our concern is those who are drinking more are probably those who were at risk to begin with. Uh, and I suppose if you look at risks around, you know, maybe people drinking at home with young children uh, uh, or people who are furloughed now drinking, young people who are in employment drinking. So we're trying to monitor those, those concerns and impacts. I think there's no doubt it will have an impact on health outcomes and health inequalities going forward. Uh, and we need to relook uh, at that, I think, in a review of making life better. Um, I think I just started to mention earlier, England saw uh, a fall in life expectancy in 2020, uh, a projected fall in life expectancy of 2020 um, of about 1.3 years for men and about 0.9 years for women, but higher in areas of deprivation. And that's the first, well, life expectancy has been tailing off in terms of growth. That's the first actual fall. So uh, while we don't have those figures for here yet, um, I, you know, I would expect we will see similar figures come through and it's really important that we build recovery for public health and resilience for public health into our services going forward. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I think recovery is kind of the key word, you know, because what I'm what I'm receiving through my office is definitely, you know, your socioeconomic status. It decides uh, the the level of healthcare which you can receive, and a number of constituents have had to go private, and it's to their detriment. And and obviously, of course, there's the financial burden of going private as well. So just to note that, but no, that that's good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, panel, for coming along, for providing that briefing this morning and for addressing the questions that you were able to and for committing to providing committee with, with further information, uh, as, as was the case there. So it's, a, it's an area of massive concern. It is a key priority for the committee. Um, it's also, I think, an area that, that we all recognise is impacted by the lack of multi-annual budgeting. And that is that is obviously providing additional challenges. And I think the quicker we get to that, and and the quicker we see a Treasury facilitating that multi-annual budgeting, I think is going to be key to it. But I also have to say that year after year we are presented with the data on health inequalities, and it shows in some areas um, very little improvement. And it's clear that more more deprived communities are still afflicted by very noticeable inequalities, particular in relation to respiratory disease alcohol and substance abuse and uh, mortality and very high levels of intentional self-harm and mental health problems. So I don't think it is any longer um, 
enough just to pay lip service and to note the figures year on year, but not to see any any significant improvement. And I think if we're serious about seeing improvement, we need to see a different approach. And actually, in, in relation to that, I think the, the management board that has now been set up, is there anyone on that management board who has a specialism in terms of addressing health inequalities? Gary, are you aware? Well, well, certainly, you know, the PHA would be represented on the, the Rebuilding Management Board and obviously uh, health outcomes and health inequalities are, are, are central to what the PHA do. Uh, Dr McBride would also be on the, the Rebuilding Management Board uh, and also he is well steeped in health inequalities and, and, and addressing those issues. So he would certainly input from that as well. I would just say that the PHA actually recently presented to the um, Transformation Advisory Panel as well on health inequalities and COVID. Um, so uh, that you know was an interesting uh, uh, for, uh, opportunity to further update that that broader transformation agenda in round inequalities as well. So it's certainly fed into it, and as I say, we're also directly feeding into the process around the closure of the board and the future planning model. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I do absolutely, absolutely accept that there are people there who are very aware of the of the situation and very, uh, very like us, very worried about it. But I think, given that we cannot leave communities vulnerable, and uh, if we're serious about tackling these community the crippling inequalities that we're seeing, I think we need to take a more serious approach. And I actually think it would be worthwhile including someone with a specialism and a dedicated focus into ensuring that the programs are being put in place that are tackling and targeting, that the finance is being put in place and that the outcomes are being tracked and measured to ensure that we're seeing year on year improvement. So um, thank you very much for attending this morning and I've no doubt that we will be we will be uh, back in, 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 in on this issue with the department in whatever shape or form. But I want to thank you all for your, your work in this area and for bringing it to committee this morning. Thank you thank and you. good luck. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, okay, members, are, would members members content then that we uh, we seek that further information that members have sought? I think there is a clear, you know, it's not it's not a lack of, of understanding. We know what the problems are. We know very often where they are, and we know we know uh, what it, what is causing them. But I think there's a kind of a lack of a then seeing the follow up planning. And while there are clearly huge difficulties for the for the Department of Health, the massive department and all of that, unless you see, unless you have a dedicated idea of where it is you want to get to and a plan that is measurable and achievable and, and realistic to get there, I think you're you're always going to simply be in the area of reporting. So I think it's important that we see more of a focus. Um so would, would members agree that we, we seek that further information and we continue and come back to this as a particular focus for our work? Sure. Yeah. Yes, Carol? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And the making life better strategy, again, is going to seem like a report uh, in absence of any clear targets and an investment plan right beside it. So I, I think we need to, in your question about the health and equalities expert on the rebuilding, uh, management board for me for anything. Um, so I think we need to write to PHA and we also need to ask the department um, you know, in terms of you know, their strategy, what are the funding and investments to actually reduce the health inequalities that we've just heard from officials are? Yeah. Members, members content with that? Okay, members, so I'm going to move on then. Um, I'm going to maybe take a very short break just again to give members a, a short break and we're going to come back to a number of SRs and I'm conscious that we're, we're significantly behind time, but hopefully we can move our way through those SRs reasonably reasonably swiftly. So 12.17 there, um, could we take about a five or six minute break? Or So say, say if we come back 12.25 members, and be going again for 12.25. Thank you. That's us live now, Chair. Thank you, Clerk, and thank you, members. And we will now resume our meeting in public session. So the next three items on the agenda are SRs relating to international travel restrictions. I refer you there, members, to tabs 8 to 10 of your pack, and in particular to the Clerk's memo at tab 8.1. The department has also provided an additional briefing paper for SR 99, which can be found in your table papers there, members, at tab 7.5. Um, 
departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on the provisions of these SRs. So I would now like to welcome Ms. Elaine Colgan, who, and Elaine is head of Health Protection Branch and well known to us at this point in time of committee. Good morning or good afternoon, Elaine. Can you hear us okay? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think Debbie's here with me as well, hopefully. Uh, um, so yeah, she so, was going to do the opening briefing. Okay, so I'll just check. Uh, can you hear us okay there, Debbie? And that's Miss Debbie Sharp, International Travel League. Can you hear us, Debbie? Yes, I can, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, and we are hearing you as well. And we are also joined this morning by Karen Pearson uh, from the Executive Office, and Karen is Director of COVID Strategy and Recovery. Can you hear us okay, Karen? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, Tafal Shiro Valig, and uh, you're very welcome to, to the meeting, and thank you for coming along this morning to brief us on these SRs and to take members' questions. So we'll go ahead back to yourself then, Debbie, if you want to lead off on the briefing. Thank you. Great, thank you. So good afternoon, Chair and members. Um, so I'm here this afternoon to brief the committee on three SRs relating to international travel um, that were made since my last update with yourselves on the 15th of April. Um, so the first um, set of regulations are SR 2021 number 99. So I'll apologise in advance, this brief is quite lengthy, but the other two are very brief, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there in the end. Um, so these regulations consolidate the Health Protection Coronavirus International Regulations from 2020 and all 37 subsequent amendments since June um, last year. They also introduce new provisions for travellers to Northern Ireland with regards to mandatory post-arrival testing and the requirement for arrivals to enter into managed hotel isolation when they're travelling from red list countries. So committee members, as you've said, Chair, will have seen a letter from the department issued on Tuesday um, providing full detail of these consolidated regulations, but um, I will briefly summarise the key areas of them. So part one and schedules one and two of the consolidated regs set out the interpretation provisions and the red list and green list countries. Um, you'll be aware that the red list countries are those countries where there are highest level of concerns, focusing on the risk of variants. Green countries are those countries previously known as travel corridors and a country which is neither red or green is referred to as an amber list country. Um, part two of these consolidated regulations impose requirements on individuals arriving into Northern Ireland who have been outside the CTA um, in order to prevent the spread of coronavirus. And these requirements vary according to whether a person has been in a green, amber or red country. So these requirements are that all travellers must provide passenger information via the passenger locator form relating to their contact details and their onward travel. All travellers must possess a notification of a negative COVID test upon arrival into Northern Ireland. Travellers from amber and red list countries must obtain a testing package um, comprising a day two and day eight test, and those from green countries are only required to book a day two test. Travellers from amber list countries must self-isolate, for example, at their home or where they are staying for 10 days, and travellers from red list countries must enter into managed hotel isolation for 10 days, and these isolation facilities are uh, places designated by the Department of Health. Schedule 4 sets out persons who are exempt from the above travel requirements, and these can vary according to the nature of the exemption. Part three of the regulations prohibits aircraft and vessels from arriving into Northern Ireland from certain red list countries. Part four addresses enforcement, setting out offences, offences for breaching requirements and the levels of fixed penalty notices um, that can be issued by authorised persons. Part five addresses information sharing requirements to ensure the effective operation of the regulations and the requirements they impose. And part six and seven revoke the previous international travel regulations of 2020. Um, and they also provide that these new consolidated regs will automatically expire in June or in March 2022 and the requirement that they must regularly be reviewed um, to see if they're still needed. Um, so I'll just briefly focus on the two 
new um, requirements introduced by these regulations, namely the post-arrival testing and the mandatory isolation requirements. So travellers must be in possession of either a post-arrival testing kit or a managed isolation package before they can arrive into Northern Ireland. They, they require one or the other. The managed isolation package includes accommodation, transport to that accommodation, and the day two and day eight tests. Um, Schedule seven of the regs do set out some minor modifications to this obligation, as well as some specific exemptions for managed isolation, um, which enable certain persons to self-isolate at home instead of the hotel facility. So, moving on to the second SR um, for discussion today is 2021-102. These also come into operation on the 16th of April, like the Consolidated International Travel Regs, and these again consolidate the previous Health Protection um, Passenger Information Regulations and the Pre-Departure Testing Operator Liability Regulations, along with their subsequent amendments. Um, they are largely a remake of the previous um, provisions that were in those regs, with some adjustments to allow for the their introduction of the post-arrival testing and the managed isolation requirements. And finally, the third SR for discussion is 2021-108 that came into operation on the 23rd of April, and this amending regulations added India to the red list countries and revoked two pieces of legislation that were omitted from the consolidation um, exercise. So, happy to address any queries that the committee may have. As you know, Karen Pearson is here from the Executive Office to assist with queries on the operational delivery of the managed isolation um, side of things, and myself and Elaine can pick up any questions on the legislation itself. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Um, that's very useful. So, firstly, from me then, in relation to the issues that were raised by the examiner for statutory rules on SR99, what a what issues did she raise and what has the department done to take uh, her comments or concerns into account? Um, Dewey, anyway, I'll answer that one. Um, so the, the examiner raised a question around the enforcement, um, one of the enforcement regulations, Regulation 27, and specifically the reference in there to the obstruction offence. Uh, so if, if members are, are what are have it in front, it's 27.7D. Uh, and there's a reference there to uh, a fixed penalty notice being issued in relation to an obstruction offence for a red list arrival. Uh, and it says that where the person is believed to have intentionally obstructed any person carrying out a function relating to a red list arrival. Uh, so the examiner helpfully um, outlined that there's kind of two two criteria that need to be satisfied there. Um, per, firstly, the person has to have it, um, be believed to have intentionally obstructed a person in the first instance and, and actually carried out an offence, but they also have to believe that reasonably believe that's in relation to a red list arrival. Um, so in order to kind of just emphasize that, um, we have agreed to insert uh, in before the word believed, reasonably believed. So it's just a kind of an extra an extra um, firm measure to make sure that there has been that double check that it is both an offense has been committed, but also that it has been committed specifically in relation to a red list arrival rather than an amber or green, because that reflects the higher level of fine that would be awarded. Okay, and and in relation, then that leads me on uh, quite neatly, actually, to the issue of the the uh, the examiner, I believe, raised the issue in relation to the level of fines and the impact and the proportionality for obstruction offences. So, can you provide us with further information on the proportionality concerns and how those have been addressed? Um, yes. So the the level of fines that we have um, in place for managed isolation mirror the ones in England. Um, and that was intentional and that was agreed by the executive. In terms of proportionality, though, of course, it was still considered here. Uh, it wasn't that we just automatically took what was in place in England and introduced it here. Um, and the, the, main, the main reason why the managed isolation offences are so high is associated with the risk of variants. Um, most of the variants that are identified in red countries, well, not most of them, but some of them in, in initially, um, that we don't know an awful lot about some of them. Um, and others in Northern Ireland, we have a very low prevalence of them compared to elsewhere, even in the UK, but specifically in the world in this situation. So the risk of those being imported into Northern Ireland is so great that it is really, really essential that people comply with the, the requirements 
and, and the, the things that are being requested of them in these regulations when they come back from a red list country. Uh, the, the, the risk of a variant being uh, introduced into Northern Ireland or even just um, increased, the amount of variants increased in Northern Ireland, it's not just being introduced for the first time. If it's already here, bringing more of it in um, will then increase community prevalence and could affect, affect uh, the vaccine uh, programme and the effectiveness of that. So the, the proportionality was considered, but we do believe that they are proportionate given, given the level of risk. Okay, and and in relation to variants of concern, um, we are all very, very acutely conscious and, and horrified to see what's what's happening in India at the present time. Um, and I suppose we are also aware that there is deep cultural and uh, linkages, and 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 people often are travelling back and forward between uh, here and India and England and India. But are there are there concerns around the levels of variants of concern that we're seeing in in England in particular, and are there contingencies in place that we would be able to move quickly to contain that situation and to prevent them from, from uh, you know, becoming the problem that you have outlined they could become here for the vaccines, etc.? Um, yeah, so... Uh, the, the, in relation to India specifically, that's why we we added India to the list in the in the first amendment. Um, and Ireland also, as of Tuesday, passed have that on the red list. So all travellers coming to Northern Ireland through either DB or the Republic of Ireland will need to complete managed isolation when they arrive there first. Um, in, in in terms of the point you raised about variants in GB being brought to Northern Ireland, um, are uh, Whilst it's not in legislation that the executive has travel guidance for intra CTA travel, so from England, Scotland, Wales, or the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland, and it does ask travellers to self-isolate for 10 days when they come here. Um, there are certain exemptions to that, uh, which largely mirror what we have in place for international travel, but taking into account, obviously, uh, more tailored situations where travel is more frequent in, in certain situations, such as uh, people who live in the border area, on the land border area particularly, um, obviously we don't want to inhibit their daily life uh, so we have exemptions to allow that to happen but we do ask people to self-isolate when they come here um, it's not in law it's in guidance uh, and that's intentional because uh, obviously it's it's much more difficult to capture everything in law when you have such more frequent travel um, but we, we we do ask the public to adhere to that and that is partly the reason um, because of the variance of concern Okay, thank you. Um, and a couple of final quick ones for me then before we go to members. I had raised the issue, and you have addressed it partially, or, or you have you have you have referred to it previously, Elaine, around the issue that I had identified a number of weeks ago in relation to the availability and the accessibility of testing for people here, particularly where they're transiting through Heathrow. In, my, in the case today. Is that issue now addressed and can people access the test that they're required to access? Um, yes. Yeah. So when we introduced the testing requirements on the 16th of April, we actually initially only did it using the public tests, which are the ones that are provided through the NHS and the mechanism was well established and has been for, for several months and almost a year, perhaps more. Um, and that was intentional just to get things started. Um, as of yesterday, we have now started to allow private tests. Um, and the reason for the, for the delay was to ensure that appropriate data flows were in place from private testing providers to make sure that the public health agency received the positive test results and the contact details of those people. So uh, that gave time to get that settled in. Um, NI Direct should be updated uh, this afternoon or tomorrow morning uh, with the list of NI approved providers, uh, but it can be accessed by DHSC in the interim. Okay, thank you. And the final one for me then, and it may be, it may be maybe more for Karen, but in relation to the exceptions there for that, that have been referenced in relation to the mandatory hotel quarantine, could you give us an example of some of the exceptions to that? And also, could you address the issue again? It's something I've come across in, in terms of uh, being contacted around the issue of people where particular difficulties might arise as a result of autism or, or issues like that, where that type of quarantine would present significant and maybe maybe uh, challenges that, that would be insurmountable. Are those the types of things that are being considered in terms of exceptions? Um, yeah, if Karen's happy, what I'll do is just run through the legislation and some of the exemptions and hand over to Karen for that last point. Is that okay? And then yeah. The, the, yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the examples of things that are in the Schedule 7 um, are not necessarily... There are, there are exemptions from staying in the hotel, but they're not exemptions from self-isolating and they're not exemptions from complying with 
with the managed isolation requirements, it, you still have to comply completely the same way, other than the fact you're not in a hotel, you're somewhere else, um, which is is quite, it's, it's a nuance compared to the self-isolation for Amber countries. It's not the same thing. Um, so it's not to say that if you're exempt from the hotel quarantine, that you're then able to go out and exercise and do the things that you would be able to do if you were an amber list arrival you're not you have to stay at home and comply with the same strict requirements um, some of the exemptions are for children who are traveling to boarding school um, and the ones in the schedule have to be applied for so that it's not a case that anyone can can try to claim them at the border they have to be applied for in advance and information given to them so that they have evidence of it there are um, provisions for case-by-case -case medical circumstances which karen can go into in a bit more detail um, there's also provision not for a complete exemption from managed isolation but to leave managed isolation in certain circumstances with pre-approval and some of those might be to fulfill a legal obligation or to satisfy bail conditions um, to visit a person who who you reasonably believe to be dying or where they're a member of the household or a close family member of, in that situation uh, you can leave you can apply for leave to attend a funeral of your household or a close family member um, I think maybe if I just hand over to Karen now she can maybe go into the detail of the operation of that thank you thanks chair um yeah, just to build on what Elaine has said, um, the, the value set for this policy for us is the welfare of our guests come first. So if we find a guest has a, a need to um, ask for that exemption in advance or to leave the hotel for one of the purposes that Elaine has just outlined, we are putting in place casework arrangements and decision making arrangements for those. Um, to be honest, Chair, the numbers that we have, uh, numbers of guests we've had so far is so small. We've not yet faced a situation of this sort, but we are acutely aware of it. And between Elaine and I, we are putting these arrangements in place because um, welfare will come first. And obviously we have to be acutely aware of the possibility of a medical emergency and how we would look after our guests either at the hotel or get them to the hospital. And all of those issues are under consideration with PHA colleagues as well. It's very important to us that we get this right. Okay, thank, thank you. And I do appreciate the numbers would be small, but the impact would be horrendous in those small number of cases. So I appreciate your watching those. And I think those need like a 24 hour seven uh, facility for flagging these issues up as they arrive potentially in, in, in any of the airports. So thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to go then to members. So I'm going first of all to Pam Cameron, and then I have Paula and Carol. In, in that order at this point. I, I also have Jerry and then Orlea Flynn as well. So go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, Elaine, and the rest of the team for your attendance today. Um, a, a couple of things I want to raise, but obviously the, the elephant in the room in respect to these amendments is that requiring and enforcing the collection of passenger data from operators bringing passengers into Northern Ireland, it doesn't remove the fact that the high proportion of international travel arrivals are coming via Dublin. So therefore, you know, the central piece of the jigsaw here is is seeing um, uh, a resolution to the, the really unacceptable approach of sharing of data adopted by the Irish Authority. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, if there's been any progress made in relation to um, enhancing the passenger data sharing with the Irish Authorities. That's my, that's my first question. Hi, um, Pam. Um, I wish I had more progress, obviously, to report. Um, but what I can say is it, it is in the final stages. Um, we're waiting on the, the finalization of the technology solution uh, in the South for us to be able to access the data. Um, I, I don't lead on this piece of work. We had to get someone in specifically to do this to, to try and move it forward. Um, so my understanding is that the MOUs, whilst they're not signed, they're largely in place and awaiting the data solution and the technology solution. Um, and if it's helpful, uh, the next time we're here, it might be useful for me to bring Jonathan, who's leading on that with me, uh, and he can maybe delve into that in a little bit more detail if it's, if it's useful for members. I, I think that would be useful. Um, thank you, Elaine. And I suppose it's, it is a real shame that we're, we could all actually be out of this pandemic before this issue is resolved, which is quite incredible. Um, but obviously there is still that huge risk to um, variants that we, we don't want to see coming in. Um, I wanted to move on then to, um, you'd outlined exemptions around the hotel quarantine for red list um, countries. And I understand the exemptions around uh, people needing particular healthcare needs or whatnot, so that patients such can actually 
will have an exemption and be able to access that healthcare. But a, a situation actually arose with me where uh, there was a healthcare professional, a doctor, who had been out doing humanitarian work in a red list country and had gone out for it with a very specific skill. Um, you know, obviously out of goodness and then who was then forced to hotel quarantine on return um yes it, you know that's a, a, a very very much needed doctor um for for northern Ireland's hospitals so i'm just wondering has there been any um talk of looking at exemptions for healthcare professionals in those particular circumstances especially given that all these healthcare professionals will be um vaccinated as well fully vaccinated at this stage so is there any um anybody looking at those particular issues in terms of exemptions okay um the, we you may recall that we did have previously a healthcare worker exemption um for those that were traveling to provide healthcare and under the the regime last year um, and we did remove that and the reason that we removed it was because of the risk of uh, infection uh, being passed on in hospital um, and those health professionals unwittingly passing on virus to, pa to patients in, in vulnerable situations. Um, with the red list it's particularly acute because they would if that happened pass on a variant potentially um, and so we, we wouldn't at this, certainly at this point be in a position to provide red list exemptions for healthcare professionals. Um, what we have been uh, or what was considered at UK wide and we've been keeping an eye on was where there's overseas recruitment uh, and perhaps we, we would have uh, recruitment of medics uh, not, and nurses uh, and other professionals coming in to Northern Ireland to provide those services and rather than an exemption because of the risk that I outlined is still going to be to be present but we are thinking about whether there's um, potentially trust facilities that could be used to enable them to quarantine there rather than in hotels and that would reduce the cost or potentially uh, remove the Cost depending on the scenario. Um, the decision was taken not to introduce that just yet because instead they've actually just paused overseas recruitment. Um, but if such a th such an exemption were were to be put in, it could apply potentially, and we would need to explore it to to doctors and nurses on humanitarian um, missions, for want of a better phrase, for, for in the case that you've described. Yeah, I think that would be uh, that would be very welcome because I think it's it is very unfair. I think that people that are doing such a good thing at, at their own cost should face such um, a, an extreme cost coming at, at the other end when the list goes relatively low and, and they could be self-isolating in a different facility or at their own home and be tested daily or whatever. I think there yeah. more needs to be done, I think, in terms of looking at this particular issue. So thank yeah, you for um, that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm going there to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, ladies, for um, coming this morning. Um, I suppose the, the, the first question, I think it was in Regulation 6, it was around to, uh, possess a notification of a negative um, COVID test upon arrival. How, you, uh, how is it, um, what measures are in place to make sure um, that, 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 that it's not fraudulent or that it's been um, sort of um, produced in advance? Um, there's a couple of measures in place uh, in terms of enforcement. So the operator is required to check that the person before they board the plane or boat or whatever it might be um, to check that the person has that negative notification and that will be in country. So there will be a bit more familiarity there with the evidence being presented because it will be a local piece of evidence that those staff might be more familiar with. Uh, the second check then is whenever the the flight or boat is met by border force immigration officers they are conducting 100 percent compliance checks on international arrivals at the moment so they will be checking that the pre-departure test information is has been presented um the, it, it is more difficult with this compared to the post-arrival testing where it's much more controlled and um, so there is going to be a bit more potential for this to be um uh, to for this to for some sort of fraudulent evidence to be presented and um, because we have to leave it open because we just don't know what other governments are providing their citizens um, so but we do have that double check and the fact that there's one in the country and there's one here should um, mitigate as much as we can against that okay thank you the second question i think this is another one that's been ongoing for quite a while and that's about monitoring compliance for those who are asked to self-isolate at home um, could you talk about how that's being managed thank you 
Um, yes, yeah, so anyone who is an Amber List arrival and is self-isolating at home will receive calls from SciTel, uh, the, the contractor from Public Health England, who are contacting England and Northern Ireland arrivals, and they get calls daily within the 10 days. Um, if they have a positive test result, they will also get contacted by Track and Trace in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, so um, there is there is double checking. There is referrals ongoing to PSNI, and whilst we, they haven't had to issue any fixed penalty notices of late, they do get weekly referrals, um, it, somewhere in and around twenty to thirty per week that they follow up on, and they they generally find that the person is or will comply. Okay, thank you. And finally, for me, um, and this was a constituent came through this morning, and um, she's wanting to travel to her holiday home in Donegal in May, and. But she said she could completely self-isolate when she's there. Um, and she just wondered, I think maybe you mentioned there, um, that that's advice and guidance. It's not regulations or law. So could you just clarify that issue? Because I, I know there's, this will be a big issue for a, a large number of people in the, the coming months. Um, yes. So I can't comment on what they would need to do in Donegal because that would be under the Irish regulation. Um, but certainly from our perspective, we are very much asking people not to travel for leisure purposes across the border. Um, under our guidance, it wouldn't be an essential purpose and it wouldn't be an exemption from self-isolation when you return. Um, and the minister also this week, you may have seen in the news, was asking people specifically in that area uh, to be careful and to be mindful because of the case numbers there. So um, whilst you're right, it's guidance it's not law we would very much uh, appeal to to members of the public um just just to hang in there hang with us and uh, we all want it to to go on holiday homes and and to visit family and friends abroad and and in other parts of the the uk and roi but we would just ask you to hang in there and please um if you have to travel when you come home please do self-isolate okay thanks very much thank you thanks paula i'm going to carol go ahead carol let a hold for the presentation um, on the regulations here. Um, so I suppose I'm asking, you know, given some of the recent concerns raised at, at Westminster, I think it was during the committee, uh, that Border Force officials are certainly under a lot of pressure, uh, particularly due to social distancing and, and other pressures, I'm assuming. I'm just wondering why uh, passenger locator form information has to be provided to an immigration officer. That's my first question. And then following on from that, um, you know, the data sharing, uh, I think it's part five. How, how does this interact and relate to sharing information north south? Because it only refers to England, Scotland, Scotland and Wales. Okay. Um, yeah. So in terms of the passenger locator form information, it is presented to an immigration well the the form itself is online so it's it's presented um virtually to an immigration officer via the home office hosting the the form um but it, it is asked for at the border um whenever you meet the border force officials and the, as i mentioned they're conducting 100 percent compliance checking they don't inspect the full form they there is um a way that a person can show that they've completed it they will do a, a check to make sure some of the particular information is correct such as the the post arrival testing reference number the pre-departure test is is valid uh, so there are specific checks they do, but they don't read through the full form. Um, they, their, their, their main aim is to check that you filled it in um, and that you have the the key information um, properly recorded. In terms of the data sharing question in part five, um, we are unable in law here to reference the, the other jurisdictions outside of the UK. So whereas we are allowed to and enable to cite uh, legislation that might be in place in England, Scotland or Wales, or to cite um, certain bodies or organizations or departments that might work in, in any of those jurisdictions. We don't have the same ability to do that for the South uh, and we couldn't legally require them to share information with us. So that's why it's silent on that in part five. Okay, um, thank you, Elaine, for that. Um, I mean, this is a, a completely different question. It's just while Karen's here. Karen, we raised a couple of weeks ago about some of the um, interpretation of the, the guidance and indeed the regulations around hospitality, particularly outside. Can you just confirm that there's no difference from what was, uh, you know, agreed and uh, implemented last year compared to, compared to this year? Because there does seem to be more problems this year for local 
uh, hospitality. Um, and we just are trying to figure out what the problem is. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. No, you're absolutely right. Um, last year, we had a requirement that the outdoor environment needed to be compliant with smoking regulations. And that's what we've got again this time round. I suppose the context is, is different because we've never had the indoor outdoor split before now. Um, Last year, uh, outdoor and indoor were, were both open under slightly different um, working regimes. But I suppose if, if you're in hospitality this time around, you've only got the outdoor to work with, you're going to want to invest and be able to take customers in. So, um, but the, it, your question was about the, the, the law, and I can confirm it's the same. Thank you, Chair. So it's just down to the council. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Jerry, go ahead. At all. Thanks, Carol. Roger, Carol. Um, and thanks, Paul, for um, that. Just two quick questions. Um, Elaine said obviously about travel uh, across the border um, shouldn't be done. Uh, it's guidance, obviously. Um, uh, in terms of the, across the north, because there's a bit of confusion around um, stay local and and all that. Um, what should people do? What can they do? Uh, can they travel uh, in the jurisdiction uh, of the six counties for for, uh, for leisure? Because obviously there's been uh, the change, the restrictions to allow people to go to caravans and, and other um, type of uh, homes. And then just the final question around the, the hotel quarantining. I mean, obviously quarantining is, is essential, but I'm just kind of concerned with the, the obviously the quite high cost uh, for quarantining. Is it 1500 or, or it can be around £1,500? Um, that's um, my understanding borne by the individual. If it's not, I'm happy to be corrected. Um, but obviously, with any sort of financial um, uh, cost of that uh, kind, um, some people could be uh, dissuaded, discouraged, or refuse uh, to adhere um, because of that. So is there any work being done around addressing the figure and the cost, uh, or is that part of the consideration or not? Thanks. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, in terms of the stay local guidance, um, could I ask that you ask Nigel that whenever he comes on after me? Um, so he is covering the general restrictions regulations, and that um, is very much part of that. He can he can outline the the regulations that's currently in place and what's permitted in Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of the stay local guidance, uh, the I think Karen, well, maybe not Karen personally, but her uh, department, the, the executive office, is is looking at that and is uh, leading on the communications and that is my understanding. Um, and I'm also going to hand over to Karen for the the managed isolation cost issue, if that's okay. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the questions, Jerry. Just on the stay local. Um, we think it's timely to be looking at that just to see do we keep it in its current form but unpack it a bit for people so it's a greater understanding or is it has the time come to put something else in place so that's under active consideration at the moment on the costs it's in the region of 1750 for the lead passenger uh, or guest as we prefer to call them so the the, the 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 lead booking guest will pay 1750 and it's slightly less for other members of their party that includes the hotel um, that includes the transport, food and tests. It is a big figure, we accept that. Um, we are not passing on all costs to the, um, to the guests. Um, we are picking up some of the costs within government. Um, we, think that's, we think that's right. It is a big cost, but if we look at um, the cost to economy and society, if we had general community transmission of a variant of concern, we'd be in incredible difficulties economically and for people's well-being. Um, I don't think we're actively looking at the cost that's there at the moment, Jerry. but what we are looking at is a hardship arrangement so that we can um, put in place, we're looking to put in place an arrangement where people could pay in instalments over time. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. Just a quick, uh, very quick follow up there, Chair. Um, uh, was there any consideration uh, done, Karen, around um, department or trust um, managed facilities for quarantining? I know there was um, last year there was some procurement or um, taken over uh, of um, hospital, uh, 
hotels, sorry, in Belfast City Centre anyway, to help with uh, patient and, and services around that. But was there any work done around uh, the department uh, requiring uh, their own uh, facilities or space to, to, to manage quarantining rather than having a system where people are, are forced to, to go private? Thanks. Um, no, to be to be honest, Gary, we, we've gone we've gone with this arrangement because it's very specific to people travelling back. Um, I think the arrangements um, Elaine might be able to say more about it, but the arrangements last year were more about making sure we could look after essential healthcare workers. Um, I think that was I think that was the, the policy intent last time round. It would amount to the same. Um, it, we're going to require a hotel. We've got a hotel. It's been operational since the 19th of April, which was the first date we had a, an international flight here for a long, long time. We had to be ready for it. We've had a tiny number of passengers, but each one of them individually matters to us. So uh, under under 10 adults in total so far, um, I'm very keen not to say too much more about that because that's obviously personal information, but just wanted to give you a scale that we are talking very low numbers. That will rise, I have no doubt, um, but we've got the hotel ready with capacity. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. And Orlea, finally on this. Go ahead, Orlea. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Elaine and Karen. Um, maybe just to follow on a wee bit from that issue that Jerry raised there. Um, so in, in Part 4 in Regulation 19 around the enforcement, it states that when a person has to go into managed um, isolation, that they go to um, accommodation facilitated by the United Kingdom government. So I'm just wondering, see the running of the managed isolation centres here locally. Um, are they, do they are they managed by our Department of Health or by the British government or Westminster? Um, yeah, it, we we do it locally. So between the executive office, Karen is doing all the operational side and, and getting the hotels ourselves. The reason that refers to United Kingdom government is because of the fact that the executive office is currently leading on this, but it will transfer back to the Department of Health. And it will also be part of the Department of Health and Social Care's contract for England's managed isolation. So it was just a bit messy to try to work out which department should be named there. Um, and we didn't want to have to keep changing it. So well, that's why it refers to the United Kingdom government. It means it can cover any department who is involved no that that's fair enough Liam. thanks very much and i suppose karen already touched on it there just around the <clears throat> the capacity and the facilities that are existing at present for the managed isolation so if you have that that hotel you know sort of up and running and ready to go and you sort of you're already looking at the numbers and and how they might raise um over the next few months maybe just finally then um if someone's arriving into the north from the south of ireland um, I think it was in Schedule 5 and 6, it was saying that they have two hours to get managed isolation. And I'm just wondering, where are those managed isolation facilities? Is that still falling under the, the hotel that Karen had mentioned? Yeah, it's the same package. So if a person is coming, well, first of all, I should say that it will be in very few circumstances. Um, Ireland's red list is larger than Northern Ireland's by some way. It's almost twice as long. Um, so it will be very few people that will find themselves not needing to manage isolate in the south but do in the north um, and the requirement applies to them in the same way they must go online and they must book their managed isolation package and they will be told as part of that package where the hotel is um, and once they have once they cross the border they have two hours to get there and we will keep that timing under review um, as the hotel changes because we know where the hotel is and we know roughly how long it should take a person to get there mm -hmm. um, it's very important they go straight there um, for reasons that we've already discussed today uh, and yeah. it's important that they don't get public transport if, if they can at all avoid it um, the reason that we have taken that approach it, it's similar to the approach that Ireland have taken they have also done something similar from travelling from the north to the south um, England don't allow that that's at all in their regulations you must enter by a designated port but it's very different in England um, because you would either be flying in getting a boat or there's only a certain number of uh, places whereby you can get to England and they can have those staffed and mm -hmm. um, we did not want to do that because we didn't want to make travel over the land border illegal in any circumstances and um, so that's why that provision is included okay that's great Elaine and maybe just to come back to see the point you made there that the um so the countries that are on the red list in the south that their list would maybe be as twice as large as ours is, is there any, have you any rationale or explanation for that? It just seems a bit odd that, you know, 
that, that there's such a, a massive difference between north and south? Um, yeah, I guess they, they're using different criteria, I, I assume. Um, I don't know what their assessment criteria is and, and what, what, what they do use to determine whether something goes on the list. Um, they would have a lot of countries on, that's on our AMBER list uh, and we, we still legally require self-isolation um, and we require testing, post-arrival testing. Um, so th I, as far as I know that there isn't post-arrival testing in the South, at least not as part of the regulations. So, um, we, we have sort of adjusted different mitigation in place. Uh, the, the main concern for us is variants. So that's what we want in managed isolation. Um, mm -hmm. if, if for others where there's less risk of variants and it's about transmission uh, and only transmission, then ensuring compliance with self-isolation, if we can do that, that, that mitigates effectively the risk. And we don't want to put additional um, requirements on someone whenever it's not justified or proportionate. Uh, so we, we would, we're, it's not to say we will not hesitate to put, to make a country red if that's what's required, but we don't want um, to make a country red that, that doesn't need to be. So I'm assuming the, the fundamental basis is just how the two countries assess uh, the lists. And is that being discussed, Elaine? Um, I mean, because surely that, that will cause complications for the health departments on both sides of the border. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, we would still, if people are travelling south to north or north to south, you know, to me, it doesn't really make sense that with two different red lists, and especially not at that, that scale, um, is that part of the MOU, is that part of the department, you know, are you speaking with the department in the south around that, maybe just some of the problems yeah. that may create for, for, for us and for the south? Um, we do talk to the South kind of around the lists generally. Um, I think actually most of those conversations about alignment of the two lists is actually going on at UK government level with the Irish government and they're, they're not something that we are focusing on, but they are, as far as I know, going on. Um, at the moment, we're quite relaxed in that it's, it's favourable for us. There's more countries on their list than ours, but it, it could quite easily swing the other way. Um, and, and it is something that we are talking to them and keeping a watch on it uh, in terms of our own capacity and needs and also what we would need to put in place to make sure that we're identifying people who come over the land border and to make sure that they are going straight into their hotels as required. Yeah, OK, Elian, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. I'll just briefly check with Pam because we are under some pressure time. Pam, were you looking back in there on an issue? Yes, please, Chair. Very, very quick. And it's just on the back of um, Orlea's question, which was very helpful in terms of the, uh, the scenario where you may be required to hotel quarantine in Northern Ireland, um, having come from um, the Republic of Ireland. And I'm just wondering, Elaine, can you tell us if uh, just that issue around the travel and the, the two are the two-hour time slot basically to get from A to B, but if you know people did stop off or hire a car or did take public transport or whatever, does contact tracing actually kick in at some stage to ensure that you you've picked up any anybody who might be affected and, and not know? Um, certainly they would at the moment. The numbers, as Cara mentioned, are very small and, and PHA have been very proactive with the guests that are in hotels and talking to them um, usually the first day of their arrival or within 24 hours of their arrival just to, to find out their full story and how they've come to arrive here and take any necessary action. Uh, so certainly at the moment, yes, and it is something we'll keep a watch on as numbers increase. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you um, as ever, Elaine, Debbie and Karen for, for engaging with the committee. We, we'll go into our consideration now more formally, but thank you for your attendance here and your assistance this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Um, okay, members, thank you. Thank you. Um, so listen, I'm struck there by the number of issues that continue around this, and I think it is, it is a matter of concern around the perhaps ineffectiveness of the memorandum of understanding, which we all welcomed as, as a significant step away back at the start of this. I think it actually would be useful. I know we have been, we, we've been looking for a joint committee meeting, but I think it would actually be really useful at this point to get an update from the chief medical officer, maybe in relation to his review of the, uh, of the coordination north-south via the MOU, because, and I'm conscious what, 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 uh, what you said, Pam, in relation to hopefully it's not as important now, but we are probably looking at a significant situation of where we could have further waves of this in the autumn, and it'll become very important then again. It's also the case that sometimes we've been ahead in the trajectory, the South has been behind, sometimes been aligned, sometimes we've been behind. So I think these are all issues that really need addressed urgently and still need addressed. And we have also committed, I think as a committee, 
to glean in the learning for future pandemics. And this is clearly one of the issues that has never been fully got to grips with. So I think maybe would committee members agree that we seek a, a briefing from the CMO in relation to how these issues, what the issues remaining are, how they're being addressed, and what, le what lessons are being implemented for the future that we never see such a slow kind of coordination. And I think that also includes around the messaging, the stay local, that has varied both sides of the border at different times. Would members agree that we get the CMO, we request the CMO come and give us that briefing? Yeah, okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, Pam, are you yeah. looking in there? Yeah, just briefly, just to yeah. say, yes, I would agree with that. Like, given the risk uh, of the area coming from other places in the world, I think it, it's vitally important that the issues of the LTA in terms of that information sharing, I think it's really important that we don't stop the good work that's gone on in the vaccination program by allowing the variants in. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Pam. Your sound was quite bad, but I caught, I caught enough of that. So listen, members, I'm going to go ahead with our uh, individual individual consideration in turn of each of the SRs, and these, these ones are subject to negative resolution. So first of all, SR 2021 forward slash 9999. I refer members to have seven of your pack. Can I remind members that this SR is a consolidation of the travel regulations and introduces new provisions for incoming travellers with regards to mandatory post-arrival testing and the requirement to enter managed isolation for arrivals from red list countries. The examiner confirms that there has been a breach of the 21-day rule, but she is content with the reasons for that breach. She also drew attention to a clarification which the department confirms will be made to their drafting. The department will amend regulation 277D of the regulations to insert the word reasonably immediately before the word believed, as has been outlined for us there by Elaine this morning. The department also confirms that it will make this amendment at the earliest opportunity. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Can I then for ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 99, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Regs, LA 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you, members. Item 8 then is SR 2021 forward slash 102. I refer members to your papers there at tab 8 of your pack. And can I remind members that this SR requires those arriving from outside the common travel area to complete a passenger locator form and have proof of a negative test result. It places certain requirements on operators to provide advice to passengers and it makes breaches of these provisions an offence. The examiner confirms that there is a breach to the 21-day rule, but she is content with the reasons for that breach. Have members any further issues you wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you. Can I ask members then to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Operator Liability and Information to Passengers Regulations 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Are we content? Yeah, thank you. Item 9 then is SR 2021 forward slash 108. This uh, I refer members to the papers of tab 9 of your pack there. And can I remind members that this SR adds India to the list of red countries and revokes certain other regulations? The examiner confirms there is a breach to 21-day rule, but is content with the reasons for the breach. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. Thank you. And then I, I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 108, the Health, Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Regulations and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Okay, members, we will now move to consideration of two Health Protection SRs. I can advise members that one of these SRs, 117, has been added as an additional agenda item. I refer members to the papers of tab 10 of the pack and to tab 17 of your table papers. A clerk's memo is provided at tab 10.1 of the pack. I also refer members to tab 12.30 in table papers, which is a response received from the Minister in relation to issues that members raised at last week's briefing on the SRs relating to health protection restrictions. 
I can advise that a departmental official is here today to provide a briefing on the provisions of the regulation before us today, including, I hope, the, the late inclusion uh, of that SR. So I now welcome Mr. Nigel McMahon. Nigel is Chief Environmental Health Officer within the Department of Health. Um, Nigel, you're welcome once again to our meeting. Uh, can you hear us okay? I can hear you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yep, we're hearing you there. Fine. To follow your role of the Tranona Shaw, Nigel, you're very welcome this afternoon. Please go ahead with your briefing. Thank you very much, Chair uh, and members, and thanks for the invitation today. Um, the committee this afternoon is considering two statutory rules, SR 2021, number 109, which is a second amendment to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations, Northern Ireland 21, and SR 2021, number 117, which is the third amendment to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, so if the Chair is content, I'll briefly begin by outlining the context and the content of each of these SRs, and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions from members. Yep. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, the context of these regulations we're discussing today was the first review of the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and that was considered by the Executive on the 15th of April. At that time, the rolling average of new positive cases had declined as a consequence of the restrictions that have been in place since the 26th of December 2020. The daily number of cases had, cases had settled at around 100 per day and the R number for cases was around one. The daily number of new COVID-19 hospital admissions had fallen to a relatively low level, and COVID-19 bed occupancy was also falling, though many patients that were admitted around that time were likely to remain in hospital for some time. It was not possible to provide a reliable estimate of the R number for hospital admissions due to the low numbers. The overall ICU position remained a concern, the standard funded provision is for 72 ICU beds. Any ICU beds open above this level require the deployment of staff from elsewhere. As of the 12th of April, the total number of critically ill patients stood at 69. Of these, seven were COVID positive, a reduction compared to the peak of 74 on the 24th and 25th of January. The positive impact of the vaccination program continued to be observed with a reduction in the proportion of cases aged over 60 and a reduction in the proportion of hospital admissions aged over 80. At its meeting on the 15th of April, the executive concluded that overall the restrictions and requirements remained a necessary and proportionate response to the epidemic. However, it was also agreed that a number of careful easements could be made under a gradual and measured process. The CMO and the deputy CSA's advice at the time was that the risk of the spread of infection is much lower outdoors than indoors, and this was reflected in the relaxations that were agreed. Just to remind members that the Executive Office are responsible now for a revised process that supports the pathway for recovery. This uh, responsibility includes receiving and managing all proposals for change from uh, Executive Departments, the management of the decision-making process, and the facilitating consultation with the departments on the drafting of the necessary amendments to the regulations. This work is supported by a cross-departmental working group that meets weekly and is chaired by the uh, director of TEO COVID-19 Task Force team and has membership from all nine departments, key stakeholders, and including local government and the PSNI. So moving on then to SR 2021-109, uh, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, Amendment number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. This is the second amendment to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. And the regulations were made at 10 p.m. on the 22nd of April, with regulations one to 34 commencing on the 23rd of April, followed by regulations 35 to 53 commencing on the 30th of April. At its meeting on the 15th of April, the executive ratified proposals to ease restrictions on the 23rd of April, the 30th of April, and to give indicative dates for further restrictions easing in May. This SR makes amendments to allow restrictions to be eased on the 23rd and 30th of April only. On the 23rd of April, this SR provides that the following may resume. 
driving tuition, including driver testing, close contact services on an appointment only basis, the opening of outdoor visitor attractions, outdoor sport organized by a club individual or individuals affiliated to a sport body or organizations extended to allow squad training to take place, competitive outdoor sport organized by a club individual or individuals affiliated to a sports body or organization with participant numbers not exceeding 100 and no spectators permitted. Equine assisted therapy and learning, provided that it does not exceed 30 persons in total. And practice or rehearsal by a band outdoors, provided that the band does not engage in a procession. The gathering consists only of the band and no person in the gathering engages in singing. On the 30th of April, this SR provides that the number of people allowed to meet outdoors in a private dwelling is increased from from uh, is increased to 15 from up to three households. The curfew on off sales and takeaways is removed and that the following may also reopen. All retail businesses, self-contained tourist accommodation, including holiday homes, static caravans, touring caravans and motorhomes, outdoor hospitality, both licensed and unlicensed, limited to six persons from no more than two households per table, not including children aged 12 and under, and with an allowance for larger single households with contact details recorded. Indoor swimming for uh, um, indoor swimming or diving pools or indoor exercise facilities can open for the purpose of individual activity, activity by an individual with a carer or carers, or training or coaching by an individual with a trainer or coach, provided that the person responsible takes reasonable steps to ensure that each participant maintains a distance of two meters from any other person on the premises. And there were a few uh, other consequential technical amendments. If we could just move on then to um, SR 2021-117, and thanks to the committee for adding that today, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations Amendment number three regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. This SR is a third amendment to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. The regulations were made at 6 p.m. on the 30th of April and came into operation at the time they were made. The statutory rule allows a provider in receipt of grant funding from the Education Authority to deliver youth activities for persons aged 4 to 25 years in an informal setting and allows members of a household bubble or party to be seated at the same table in hospitality, in outdoors, in hospitality premises. These corrections to the main regulations should ensure that youth activity programs, including TBUC camps planned for this summer, are able to be delivered and clarifies that persons from the same, same household or bubble or the same party can be seated at the same table in outdoor hospitality without the need to be two metres socially distanced from each other. I hope this provides um, a summary of the context in which the two sets of amendments were made and an outline of the content. And just to note that the second review of the 2021 regulations is required to take place on or before the 13th of May. And just to say that the scope of the regulations obviously reaches across the policy responsibilities of a number of government departments. Uh, and if I'm unable to answer a question today, I'm quite happy to take that away to talk to colleagues and, and uh, come back to the, the committee after the meeting. So um, thanks for listening and uh, happy to take any questions now that the committee may have. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Um, I suppose one question I would have is in relation, and it's kind of where you finished up there, in relation to the executive office and other departments. But is it is it the case that these uh, regulations remain the responsibility of the Department of Health, and that they they are not uh, proposals are not proceeded with a uh, uh, given unless there is approval from the Chief Medical Officer, the Deputy Chief and, and best international best practice, does that remain the case despite the involvement of other departments? That remains the case, Chair. Um, the power to make the regulations uh, came by way of an amendment to the 1967 Public Health Act that was made by the Coronavirus Act. Um, so the department uh, is the only department that retains the power to make regulations um, in response um, to the coronavirus epidemic. Um, the process has changed in that um, TEO now, now, now manage that in terms of taking in proposals from other departments for change. Uh, part of that process includes uh, the input and advice from CMO, CSA, 
and that along with other evidence uh, is considered by the executive in deciding whether to uh, accept those proposals for change or indeed uh, modify them in some way. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to members then. Pam Cameron, go ahead please, Pam. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Nigel, for your for your brief there. Um, just a couple of questions. C could you tell us what level of engagement with businesses and sectoral reps, um, for instance, hospitality, took place during and after the drafting of these regulations? And and I really would like to know, uh, you know, how we can avoid a repeat of the problems witnessed in respect of the outdoor hospitality last week. That's my first one, and I have another one for you. Um, I'm not particularly cited on the extent of the engagement, um, Pam, um, and that's because that's largely taken forward by the relevant department, you know, who are making the the, uh, the proposal. So in, in terms of the proposals for the changes in hospitality, they would have come from the Department for the Economy, um, who do have, I understand, wide ranging engagement with their um, sectoral rep reps, but also the executive office, I believe, had a number of meetings with representatives of the hospitality sector as well. So I'm well aware that there was quite significant uh, engagement around what was proposed. It just wasn't directly with the Department of Health. Okay, thanks for that. And could you could you tell us that you maybe need to go in and check us first? But are there any plans to pilot um, non socially distance events at um, Northern Ireland uh, events? Um, and if we're not planning to pilot any such events, um, are we cooperating with the UK government to to harness their findings? Um, well, I think I could say, it, whilst the Department of Health at this point in time um, aren't engaged, that I think there are um, uh, lines of communication across the four UK countries about what's proposed on pilots. Clearly, um, there could potentially be a lot to learn from what's going on elsewhere and a need to sort of avoid reinventing the wheel. If, if uh, pilots for certain types of events are going on elsewhere, then maybe we might focus on something else. What I would say is I do know it's part of active uh, discussion within TEO at the moment with a view to bringing something forward to the executive on that. Um, so it is actively being looked at. My expectation would be that any proposal for pilot would again come back to the Department of Health for the consideration of CMO and CSA, not only in terms of the safety of any such pilot, but to make sure that they're set up and organized in such a way um, that we can get good learning from them. That's great, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Jerry Carroll, but just before I go across to Jerry, I want to flag up to members and panel that we, we may at some point shortly fall come out of broadcasting, and at that point we will see other members of the audience being brought up into the spotlight, but we can continue on uninterrupted uh, in that sense. So go ahead, Jerry. Little help. Yep, it can be Jerry, yep. Yep. Tom. yep. Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Uh, just a quick question. I was told to ask it in the last session, so I'll ask it uh, to yourself. Um, if you watched, you may have uh, gathered what it is. Um, in terms of travel uh, within the north, within the six counties, um, we know there's guidance for people not to travel across the border for leisure purposes. Um, what is the current state of play? Um, can people travel across the north for leisure uh, purposes, for exercise purposes? Uh, is there any guidance to that? And can you just give us a quick um, update on that? Because there's obviously a lot of confusion. There's talk about clarity around state level, but um, that hasn't been clarified as far as I know, because people are asking me uh, this question. So I appreciate it if you could provide some clarity on what people can do, whether they can travel for leisure um, uh, within the north or not. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, probably not be able to provide total clarity, unfortunately, but. Um, maybe it'd be helpful just to have a quickly run through the sort of sequence of events on this and how we got to where we are. Um, a written ministerial statement from First Minister, Deputy First Minister on the 1st of April uh, announced the decisions that would come into play on the 12th of April. Um, and part of that was the ratification of the decision to remove the stay at home provisions in the legislation and a move to a stay local and a work from home message. So from uh, our perspective in terms of the legislation, then with the removal of the restrictions on movement from the 12th of April, then there were no longer any legal restrictions uh, at all on, on uh, travel within Northern Ireland for any purpose. Um, obviously, 
in around the, the CTA and elsewhere is a matter for the travel regulations. I understand that that's not that's not um, limited either. Um, but basically, as far as these restriction regulations are concerned, there's nothing in the restrictions that prevents travel um, uh, anywhere for any purpose. The guidance, uh, and uh, there are different parts of guidance, including our own Department of Health guidance, um, no longer refer um, to any distance at this point in time. Um, I think we're sort of moving into a place now where um, the advice is more around encouraging people to think about safer choices, you know, the things that maybe would put them and others at more risk. And I think that's probably where um, further guidance will go in, in, in um, future. In terms of the specifics on stay local, um, the executive has been asked to agree a definition of stay local. Uh, in the current and evolving context around the, the travel, and, and clearly you will have heard that that's uh, quite quite a fast-moving um, piece at the moment, uh, and that that stay local advice be reflected in the TEO and the Executive Information Service communication strategy going forward. Um, I did check the line with TEO, who say that uh, stay local messaging is currently under review in light of the current circumstances, and that they hope to provide further clarity soon. So um, I probably can't say much more than that at the time. Okay, thanks. Okay. okay, thank you. And can I just ask all members to ensure that they're on mute? There seems to be a wee bit of background noise since we were joined in the in the spotlight there. Um, and, and I presume that confirms your...